new constitutional democracy that we now live in today. Look, I mean, I think today's event was, was important because it, it, it brought a focus to the importance of uh, the Constitution in South Africa's democracy. To me, the real threat to the Constitution of South Africa today is the massive unemployment and poverty we have in this country. Top 10 threats to human rights is the unsustainable conditions of poverty, inequality, unemployment, load shedding, violent crime, and declining social, educational, and health services that constitute the lived daily experience of a majority of South Africans. These people deserve a South Africa that fights for them too. The decision to make nuclear weapons was taken before I became a member of the cabinet. I was shocked when I heard about it. I never liked the idea. This is the 30th anniversary of the announcement of South Africa to eliminate its nuclear arsenal. Today's conference on property rights is part of an emotionally charged political debate that will define South Africa's ability to become a better country. But it's also a recognition of your fundamental human rights. Property rights are human rights after all. And this essentially is what this conference is discussing today. How to promote property rights, but also how to defend property rights against uh, malicious actors. Everybody needs to work together in one single united direction in legislative policy that is cohesive so that we can achieve the goal. In this episode, we're going to deal with F.W. de Klerk and South Africa's international relations. This is the second memorial lecture, and it will be delivered by Professor Chet Crocker. The time has passed for visiting Americans to give sermons, because South Africans are shaping their own destiny. So the link here is FW's ability to make things possible. On the 15th of October, 1992, FW de Klerk received a telephone call from the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation. Thank you to all the viewers, and I trust that we will build a wide network of people that share the same values and the same ideals and other custodianship of the FW Clark Foundation and in collaboration with other like-minded organizations, we can change the fortunes of South Africa and all of its people. Today's event marks 33 years since Mr. de Klerk announced the new constitutional democracy that we now live in today. Look, I mean, I think today's event was, was important because it, it, it brought a focus to the importance of uh, the constitution in South Africa's democracy. To me, the real threat to the constitution of South Africa today is the massive unemployment and poverty we have in this country. Top 10 threats to human rights is the unsustainable conditions of poverty, inequality, unemployment, load shedding, violent crime, and declining social, educational, and health services that constitute the lived daily experience of a majority of South Africans. These people deserve a South Africa that fights for them too. The decision to make nuclear weapons was taken before I became a member of the cabinet. I was shocked when I heard about it. I never liked the idea. This is the 30th anniversary of the announcement of South Africa to eliminate its nuclear arsenal. Today's conference on property rights is part of an emotionally charged political debate that will define South Africa's ability to become a better country. 
but it's also a recognition of your fundamental human rights. Property rights are human rights after all. And this essentially is what this conference is discussing today, how to promote property rights, but also how to defend property rights against uh, malicious actors. Everybody needs to work together in one single united direction in legislative policy that is cohesive so that we can achieve the goal. In this episode, we're going to deal with F.W. de Klerk and South Africa's international relations. This is the second memorial lecture, and it will be delivered by Professor Chet Crocker. The time has passed for visiting Americans to give sermons, because South Africans are shaping their own destiny. So the link here is FW's ability to make things possible. On the 15th of October, 1992, FW de Klerk received a telephone call from the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation. Thank you to all the viewers, and I trust that we will build a wide network of people that share the same values and the same ideals and other custodianship of the FW Clark Foundation and in collaboration with other like-minded organizations, we can change the fortunes of South Africa and all of its people. Today's event marks 33 years since Mr. de Klerk announced the new constitutional democracy that we now live in today. Look, I mean, I think today's event was, was important because it, it, it brought a focus to the importance of uh, the constitution in South Africa's democracy. To me, the real threat to the constitution of South Africa today is the massive unemployment and poverty we have in this country. Top 10 threats to human rights is the unsustainable conditions of poverty, inequality, unemployment, load shedding, violent crime and declining social, educational and health services that constitute the lived daily experience of a majority of South Africans. These people deserve a South Africa that fights for them too. The decision to make nuclear weapons was taken before I became a member of the cabinet. I was shocked when I heard about it. I never liked the idea. This is the 30th anniversary of the announcement of South Africa to eliminate its nuclear arsenal. Today's conference on property rights is part of an emotionally charged political debate that will define South Africa's ability to become a better country. But it's also a recognition of your fundamental human rights. Property rights are human rights after all. And this essentially is what this conference is discussing today. How to promote property rights, but also how to defend property rights against malicious actors. Everybody needs to work together in one single united direction in legislative policy that is cohesive so that we can achieve the goals. In this episode, we're going to deal with F.W. de Klerk and South Africa's international relations. This is the second memorial lecture and it will be delivered by Professor Chet Crocker. The time has passed for visiting Americans. Next two minutes, we're just waiting on uh, 
some of our other panelists and some more guests. Uh, but don't despair, uh, we won't keep you very long. We would like to start at uh, 2 o'clock. We will graag begin om 2 uur. Uh, enjoy yourselves. Uh, there is some nice cold water outside, cool drinks, and uh, some good stuff to enjoy. Uh, please help yourself with that. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to start. Can I just get an indication? Uh, is the mayor here already? Not yet. Okay. All right. We have our other two speakers here, and I think <clears throat> let's uh, start the day off. I am uh, Christo van der Rede. I am the newly appointed executive director at uh, the FW, the Clerk uh, Foundation. Uh, so they literally threw me into the deep end of the pool. So my job is to start swimming. And that's what I'm about to do. So ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I would like, um, welcome, Mr. Mayor, please proceed here right to the front. I would like our chairperson, Ms. Elida de Klerk, to please step to the front and uh, to deliver her maiden's address, welcome address. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's both an honor and the privilege to stand before you today as we gather for the opening of the conference South Africa at 30. I would like to thank the Conrad Adenau Siftung who are our co-hosts for all the support and for believing in us over the years. This event marks a significant moment in our shared understanding towards reconciliation and pursuit of a more just society. We are extremely delighted to announce the arrival of Christo van der Riede as our executive director. As we come together under the banner of the FW De Klerk Foundation, we are reminded of the complex history that shaped our nation. The foundation's commitment to promoting constitutional democracy and human rights echoes the aspirations of South Africa that seeks unity in diversity, justice for all, and the shared vision of peace, progress, and prosperity for our future. FW played a pivotal role in our nation's history and his leadership during a time of profound transformation has left an indelible mark on our collective consciousness. This conference provides us with an opportunity to reflect on the progress we've made, acknowledge the challenges that persist and charter a course forward in the spirit of collaboration. In the spirit of reconciliation, we must recognize that our diversity is a strength. It's only through open dialogue, understanding and commitment to justice that we can build bridges, that we can overcome the legacy of the past. The foundation's dedication to the promotion of constitutional values serves as a guiding light in our ongoing quest for a more in inclusive and equitable society. Let us remember that uh, the pursuit of justice requires a collective effort. May this conference be a forum for constructive dialogue a space for the exchange of ideas and a catalyst for positive change. Thank you for your commitment to this important cause and I'm looking forward to the meaningful conversations that will take place. Thank you, Elita. I'm now going to ask uh, Mr. Dave Stewart. Now, Dave was our uh, executive director, previous executive director, as well as a chairperson. Dave will set the scene for today's interaction, 
Dave, who is also our current chairman emeritus. Dave, over to you. Thank you, Christo. Thank you, Elita. Um, welcome, uh, honored guests and honored speakers. On the 27th of April, the new South Africa will celebrate its 30th birthday. We thought that this, the 34th anniversary of F.W. de Klerk's speech to Parliament on the 2nd of February, 1990, would be an excellent opportunity to consider the progress that we have made in the last 30 years, where we stand now with regard to the goals we set ourselves in the 1993 and 1996 constitutions, and our likely trajectory for the future. Hence, the conference's title, South Africa at 30, Looking Back, Looking Around, and Looking Forward. We invited Trevor Manuel to speak about the last 30 years primarily because of the leading role that he played during the first 15 years of our new society. As finance minister between 1996 and 2009, he achieved economic growth of more than 5% between 2005 and 2007, and reduced national debt to only 26% of GDP, and in so doing, halved the state's interest payments. In 2006-2007, he actually produced a budget surplus, and this is the holy grail of all fin finance ministers. He also played a leading role in establishing the National Planning Commission and in producing the National Development Plan, which even critics have to admit was a rational and comprehensive program to address South Africa's core challenges of unemployment, education, and sustained economic growth. If a genie had popped out of a bottle on the morning of the 2nd of February, 1990, and said to me, Dave, this is what South Africa will look like in 30 years. Do you want it? I would have said, I take it with both hands. <laughs> I grab it with both hands because despite the many, many challenges we face, despite the many failures and disappointments, the situation could have been far, far worse. And the fact is that despite these disappointments, despite these failures, we're here in Cape Town, 2nd of February, 2024, and we're living in a functioning constitutional democracy. We still have independent courts, which frequently hand down judgments against the government, which to its credit, it obeys. Although they are under pressure, we still have Free institutions, we are still a remarkably free society, and later this year we shall be holding our seventh national and provincial elections. One of the prime guardians of our Constitution and our Bill of Rights is the Office of the Public Protector. It is for this reason that we have invited our new Public Protector, Advocate Koleka Kaleka, to speak to us about the present and about the defense of the core constitutional values on which the future of all our people depend. We have asked her to look at South Africa today and to share her views on how we are doing with, uh, with the realization of the foundational values in the Constitution especially with regard to human dignity, the achievement of equality, 
and the advancement of human rights and freedoms. Finally, there's the future. We thought that we should invite a young leader to share with us a vision of what South Africa might achieve in the next 30 years. Will and how will we be able to achieve the goals articulated in the preamble to our constitution, especially the goals of unity and diversity, social justice, and the, impro the improvement in the quality of life for all South Africans. We are delighted that our mayor, jo Jordan Hill Lewis, accepted our invitation to share with us his vision of the future. Naturally, all three guests uh, will have views not only on their specific topic, but on the past, the future, and the present. So we're arranging a panel discussion after the main speeches in which they'll be able to exchange views across the spectrum. And then we shall conclude our proceedings with the presentation of our annual F.W. de Klerk Goodwill Award to the Free, Free Market Foundation for its inspiring Kayalam project that has already conveyed more than 10,000 title deeds to property owners in South Africa. One last word, enjoy. <laughs> enjoy the conference, enjoy the exchange of ideas, and afterwards, enjoy joining us for a drink. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor now to call on Mr. Gregoire Jager. He is the resident representative of the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung Foundation. Welcome, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, esteemed speakers, and friends of the F.W. de Klerk Foundation, dear Mrs. Elita de Klerk. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us at the F.W. de Klerk Foundation Annual Conference 2024, where the theme, South Africa at 30, looking back, looking around, looking forward, invites us to reflect on the nation's remarkable journey. My heartfelt gratitude to the F.W. de Klerk Foundation for hosting this important event and being a crucial and reliable partner over the years. It is an honor to stand before you today as the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung's resident representative for South Africa. CAS promotes democracy worldwide under the guiding principles of freedom, justice, and solidarity closely aligned with the values of the German CDU party, we continue our commitment to fostering democracy, rule of law, and social market economy in South Africa. Our collaboration with the F.W. de Klerk Foundation is a testament to our shared vision and dedication to upholding the values that both President de Klerk and Chancellor Adenauer championed in their respective nations. May I extend a special welcome to one of my predecessors as CAS resident representative Frank Spengler, who served CAS in South Africa from the early to mid 90s. He distinguished himself in many other leadership positions in our foundation, including as deputy head of the Division for European and International Cooperation. In the context of South Africa's vibrant political landscape where one party has been dominant, the activities of Konrad Adenauer Foundation have focus, focused on strengthening political institutions, promoting a multi-party system, system, and supporting civil society organizations. The success of these efforts here in South Africa, but also in over 100 other countries in the world lies in our partnerships with strong local stakeholders who share our commitment to democracy and justice, such as, as the F.W. de Klerk Foundation, which promotes and defends the South African Constitution. 
Today we celebrate the day that former president declared in his historic, historic speech on the 2nd of February 1990, set the stage for the end of apartheid, paving the way for a non-racial non and democratic South Africa. This year, the country turns 30 years old. I'm happy that we have come together to celebrate and critically engage with this birthday. South Africa finds itself at a critical juncture to script the next chapter in history. Much like any person at 30, this anniversary is an opportunity to think about what has happened, what is happening now, and where South Africa wants to go. What went well? We should begin with the new South Africa's auspicious birth. A first democratic election saw a high turnout and a result that was accepted by all participating parties, despite the enormous tensions before. This was followed by a golden childhood, a golden childhood from 1994 to 2007. It saw the formation of a government of national unity that signaled the willingness of the biggest political parties to work together and recognize the national interest. The risk of a civil war was initi war initiated by reactionary groups became entirely impossible. A new democratic constitution was written and passed, correctly and widely lauded as one of the best liberal constitutions in the world. The rule of law was entrenched and its legitimacy accepted. South Africa returned to the family of nations. Fiscal debt was reduced, employment and the average GDP per capita increased. But then, bear with me as we extend this metaphor another step. The golden child became what parents fear, a teenager. <laughs> a teenager that then proceeds to a strained transition out of school. At 13 years old, in 2007, a trend change began and we find South Africa now in trouble. GDP per capita declined in real terms. Unemployment, given the growing population, steadily climbed. At the age of 13, electricity outages started. And then a new term entered our vocabulary, state capture a time in which grand corruption became part of South Africa's political culture and can therefore be seen as an attack on the young democracy and its state institutions. A misspent youth, perhaps, but as in life, lessons were learned. The ability of political parties, especially the party that has been in power for a long time, to hide corruption from the voter through political speak is beginning to disappear. The link between corruption and failing state services is becoming clear to everyone. A mismanaged state has been correctly recognized as the reason for high unemployment, a failing health and education system, violent crime, and the lack of service delivery, amongst many other self-inflicted disasters. All of this is accompanied by an alienation of the population from the political system, the parties and state institutions. One indicator of this is the ever-decreasing voter turnout. It is the task of all political forces in this country but also of civil society and the media to convince people to make use of their democratic right. At 30, this year's election will likely see the beginning of a fully fledged democracy as designed in the constitution, which was set out for a truly competitive multi-party democracy. South Africa has reached a turning point. But like in all change, opportunities and risks abound. We, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, will support South Africa in the challenging years ahead to size the momentum of democratic consolidation under the rule of law. So that at its 40th anniversary, democratic South Africa can look back 
on a decade of democratic progress and success. With my final words, I would like to say, let us embrace the spirit of South Africa at 30, looking back, looking around, looking forward. Together, let us continue the journey towards a more just, democratic and united South Africa. Let us get to work to be engaged in this crucial election year. Through many conversations, I have come to know South Africans as hardworking, motivated and as strong-willed people who go their own way to change things for the better. And this is precisely why I'm not worried about the future of this beautiful country. Thank you for your attention and may the principles of freedom, justice and solidarity guide on our path. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's a very sober analysis of where we find ourselves as a country. But let us get into the meat of uh, today's proceedings, and I am quite honored to have Mr. Trevor Manuel, our former Minister of Finance, who will talk to us. And in fact, he phoned me earlier this week and says, why should I only talk about the past? Uh, am I now too old for you to talk about the future? <clears throat> I said, no, 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 uh, you are my senior, and, and um, we have a long, long uh, way going back, um, but I would like him to please share his views, and uh, uh, it will really help us also to think even deeper about what we can do to take our country forward. Uh, Trevor, please. Thank you very much, Christo, and uh, Christo, Dave, and Elita. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Uh, when I was standing, toy toying outside Parliament 30 years ago today, I didn't think that I'd be standing on this platform discussing these issues. But let me also welcome you. Uh, are you still your worship, the mayor, uh, our public protector, uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends? <clears throat> Today we're reflecting on a set of hugely significant political decisions announced 34 years ago. <clears throat> As already raised, can somebody get me some water, please? Water. <clears throat> um, those decisions laid the basis for the inexorable and irrevocable changes that are manifested in our Constitution. One of the challenges that confronts us is how to ensure that successive generations are kept aware of the journey that our country traversed. Um, by my reckoning, uh, uh, Jordan, I think you may have been like four years old when all of this stuff happened. <laughs> Three, sorry. Three. Now, it's a fundamentally important issue because that journey needs to be embedded and taken forward, and you can't pretend that it's just something that ha happened on one fine day all those years ago. You see, because if we don't deal with these issues adequately, if we don't embed the experiences adequately, the risk is always that history may repeat itself in strange ways. In fact, part of, part of the challenge that confronts us as a people is that from time to time, there are still flare-ups of the residue of the past. You can look at Kroblerstal today and know about it. You can look at those events in Brackenfell a few years ago and know about it. Societies have to deal with difficult issues so that they can progress together. <clears throat> President F. W. de Klerk uh, took the plunge with an impact on each of the troika of responsibilities held, and bear in mind he'd been President for all of four months when the 2nd of February came along. But there's a troika of responsibilities, and the decisions announced had an impact on each of those discrete responsibilities. As head of state, he was talking to the nation, 
about fundamental change of itself. As head of a party that had been in power for 42 years, and long stays in power tend to create stasis, and so taking that on becomes an unbelievable challenge. And then as head of government, understanding the consequences of moving beyond apartheid was an unbelievably important challenge. And I'm saying part of our recall of those events of the 2nd of February 1990 is to understand that the decisions had an impact on each of the three response, core responsibilities that FW the Clerk had uh, on that day. And the three responsibilities, that of head of state, head of government, and, sorry, head of state, uh, 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 head of party, and uh, 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 head, of, head of government, uh, still shapes the way in which our politics are shaped in South Africa. So we can continue to debate and even contest matters such as the impulses that led to the 2nd of, 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 of February 1990 and the conditions that led to those decisions or how much persuasion was required to reach them. But we cannot debate the impact of those decisions on each aspect of everyday life in South Africa. This is what we reflect on and recognize here today. The most fundamental and consequential manifestations that flowed from the decisions announced 34 years ago are now embodied in our constitution, as Dave said earlier. It's critical that we remind ourselves that it took six and a quarter years from that date, six and a quarter years of hard negotiations to adopt the constitution. These were years that were characterized by intense pain, contested tough negotiations, the loss of too many lives, and ultimately the joy of an election that spoke of a new nation and new possibilities. But notwithstanding that journey of six and a quarter years, the conclusions are indelibly there for all time, as articulated in the preamble, the founding provisions in the Bill of Rights of our Constitution. I'm saying that it's quite important to remember what transpired in those six and a quarter years as well, because we must never believe that change in society happens just by announcement. It's always unbelievably difficult, and there are always vested interests that need to be dealt with. But if you don't have a beginning, you don't attain anything. And as we speak now of the Constitution, the intentions are clear, but we need to remind ourselves that we're talking of politics which uh, not necessarily for everybody in this room, if I recognize the faces, it's always a complex topic. The outcomes depend on the nature of the mandate that political parties secure, on the communications of government with the populace, and on the ability of the body politic to assist on accountability. I'd like to suggest that these become part of our discussions here today. We may want to, sorry. We may want to pause and consider the extent of changes that technology and real-time communications have on the context of politics or the conduct of politics. The reality is now that are starker than they were 34 years ago. Almost a decade ago, the then president of Chile, Michelle Bachelet, addressed an audience in the city and she said, and I quote, Societies want to be consulted in a more complex and complete manner than just through their votes. Stemming from this demand, a new objective is one for our institutions and for citizens themselves. And this demand to raise our standards beyond the strict legal sense, giving rise to new forms of dialogue and so social consultation, is the key to legitimizing the entire modern democratic system." Unquote. In other words, there's a mismatch between, our avail uh, of, between information available in real time and the fact that across the world, citizens are expected to wait for five years before they can exercise a vote. How do you bring these, how do you bring the realities together differently? It's a fundamentally important question. 
I suggest that Madame Bachelet's ob observations are exceedingly important in South Africa now as we grapple with trying to understand what works, what does not, and why. Importantly, we must continually engage in discussions about how we can improve not just the political institutions, but all of society. There's probably a surfeit of observations from the press and especially on social media platforms on how broken things are. So I'd like to spare you the detail of potholes and water and electricity and uh, perhaps our guest from Conrad Adenauer told us about those things. I'd like to spare you that. Similarly, there's no shortage of policy advice. And I don't want to be too precious about the outcomes of the National Development Plan. But it is worth reminding ourselves that as a broad framework of matters in need of urgent attention, these have been well canvassed in the chapters of the NDP. Granted that almost 12 years have elapsed since the document was handed to all political parties in Parliament, all of whom accepted the framework, with some obvious disagreements on the margins. This is, after all, politics we are talking about. I'd like to suggest that the data sets are probably now too dated, but the essential identification of the actions necessary to produce the kind of country envisaged in our constitution demands. There was an interesting exercise because uh, the members of the National Planning Commission were put together without any experience, uh, carte blanche, what will you do about the issues? And we had an interesting debate. Uh, we looked at the preamble to our constitution and one of the sharp-witted members of the commission said, is this covered by the Official Secrets Act? Why do we not talk about it as a people? And so that was the baseline that we started with. If that is the intention of democracy, how do you produce different outcomes? And that then gave rise to uh, the formation and the crafting of the National Development Plan. Regrettably, over the 12 years since it was handed to government and the parties in parliament, there's insufficient evidence of a concerted plan for implementation. I'll spare you this afternoon the rehearsal of what the NDP covers. Yet there are some of those aspects that still need to be front-loaded. For example, the task to build a capable and developmental state has become an increasingly important priority. There's been this has been accentuated also by the work of the Zondo Commission that devoted a large body of work to the discussion of the political administrative interface. Strip away the jargon, and this explains that ministers and senior public servants have different responsibilities. <clears throat> the same holds true at provincial and local government. If you ask yourself, for example, what are the powers and responsibilities of the, of the, that the South African Police Services Act designates for the Minister of Police as distinct from those given to the Commissioner, could you in all honesty say that you do? Because if you don't, it's also worth looking at Chapter 10 and Chapter 11 of the Constitution. Chapter 10 deals with public services generally, and Chapter 11 deals with all of the security services, and there's a big chunk devoted to what you expect of the minister and commissioner of police. I'm saying that they each have discrete responsibilities in law, in the constitution and in law, but in the public mind, there is no distinction between one and the other, I submit. And these are the issues that I think spell enormous difficulties for our Constitution. We may not remember, but the Constitution in that same chapter, 11, also creates a different institution, the Civilian Secretariat of Police. I think it was abandoned a number of years ago. And so we've got to go back and ask these tough questions, because if crime is a problem, we've got to understand what the institutions are meant to prevent crime and deal with it in society. But I could have selected any other cabinet position or department, not just the police, and the same issues all true. Because the primary task 
of a minister is to hold public servants in the relevant departments accountable for planning and organizing their work and for the utilization of public finances. There's little that gives us the assurance that this is actually how the administration functions presently. Let me emphasize that the essence is researched and well articulated, but unfortunately ignored to date, is that the political administrative interface be strengthened. This focus will need public service, and I want to quote from the National Development Plan, I won't bore you, it's the only quote I'll use from there, quote, immersed in the developmental agenda, but insulated from political interference, unquote. <clears throat> Resolving these matters is actually the task of governance. It's worth reminding ourselves that the Constitution sets out, quote, the principles according to which a state is to be governed. The Constitution distinctly does not substitute for the continuous act of governing which is about assigning roles and responsibilities, overseeing the raising and allocation of resources, and being held accountable for all of this. This is the first and most critical breakdown in the South African polity. Calling it out for purposes of seeking remedy is surely our number one task as South Africans. The second issue, and consequent upon the first, is the functioning of the institutions of the executive at national, provincial, and local governments, or levels, or spheres, if you must, <clears throat> and to, to ensure that all of these are held accountable. This is a serious, if badly underrated, task. One of the key matters relating to the accountability is of members of parliament themselves, and you can say, as lawyers would, uh, mutatis mutandis, provincial legislatures, and even municipal government. Paul Holden, in reflecting on the outputs of the Zondo Commission, <clears throat> observes, and I quote, it noted, the Zondo Commission that is, that MPs upon being sworn in were bound by an, by an oath to act in the best interests of the country. Surely, the Commission argued, MPs should be bound to this oath rather than the directions of a political party that might be compromised by its own corruption and inaction, unquote. Finding a solution to this intractable issue is the second paramount task. The third task relates to measurement of effort and change. There's an important presumption in the preamble to the Constitution that states that the purpose of adopting the Constitution itself <coughs> is to, amongst other tasks, quote, improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person, as Dave reminded us earlier. <coughs> if we either do not have the measurements or do not trust those that are produced, how will we ever know that governments in each sphere are making an effort to implement the constitution that requires a continuous improvement in the quality of life of citizens. As the old adage states, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. It's important to apply the same norm to every aspect of public services, education, healthcare, the built environment, policing, access to energy, water, and sanitation. No public services can be spared from scrutiny because the quality of each of our lives is measured by an amalgam of all of these functions. <clears throat> but the third task about access is also split into two. It's, it's, about, it's about public services, but it's also about the benefits brought by a growing inclusive economy where a range of matters such as employment, Employment creation, battles against inflation, access to food, groceries, uh, goods and services are all within reach. The first part is actually provided for, that's the public services and the budgeting process. Each department actually contracts with parliament. Now, this is a, this is a state secret. Uh, they contract with parliament and the contracts are bound in a big fat document called the Estimates of National Expenditure. It's about 1,200 pages. It'll be released in a few days' time, in 19 days' time, alongside the budget. 
And every department has to explain to all of us as citizens what they will do with the money that will be announced on that occasion. We don't know that it exists in that form, but it does. And so part of my invitation today is be more interested in what those commitments are. And then you can follow through because on a monthly basis, in terms of the Public Finance Management Act, they're actually, they're, they're actual expenditures of the past month. So you can, you can see their deviations. And we need to take the information and use it to ensure that the quality of life improves because if we don't do that, we aren't living constitutional values either. So that's the first, that's the public services. And the second part, I think, relates to a series of proper engagements between government and business representatives, focused on finding solutions to agreed problems, holding out that increasing numbers of people on welfare grants is a victory for democracy, actually disrespects the constitutional values and the poor themselves. The fourth task, and now it's Friday afternoon, I'm really getting into, into trouble, it's okay. The fourth task relates to securing the public representatives that South Africa deserves. I'm aware that there's a very important debate on const constituency base versus proportional representation. I'm not sure that it quite works, uh, Mayor, where you find yourself in local government because we have a ward-based system and, and a PR system. I don't think it works. My submission to you is that it doesn't have to be one or the other. There's actually no prohibition on all reasonable political parties letting their candidate choices be known before the elections and society then setting the basis for local debates which must include much matters such as the frequency of engagement and that all important questions of conscience and oath versus that matter called the party whip. The idea that party bosses alone determine who the representatives of the people will be, it's funny, they determine who the representatives of the people will be, has to be the most anti-democratic measure. Obviously, the same holds true for party bosses who can capriciously dismiss public representatives. I forget who they are, but it's a frequent <laughs> practice in some parties. <laughs> the fifth task is to have open and public discussions about the operations of each of our major institutions of governance. Looking back to this day 34 years ago, the what-if question has to arise, imagine the body politic had changed with time and not ossified. How easier the changes would have been. It's sometimes easy to look outside of ourselves at other institutions, and I, I came across an interesting factoid that the United Nations Security Council held its first meeting on the 17th of January, 1946 when the UN had 51 members. The institution retains all of the same operational rules, including veto powers, notwithstanding the fact that the UN now has 194 members. You cannot find a better example of ossific institutional ossification anywhere. For our collective survival, we must recognize that periodic elections are woefully in an inadequate corrective measure, we must build in opportunities for review and adjustment to prevent crises that appear unsolvable. But these tasks are eminently solvable. We must commit to tackling them if we value democracy. For those of us with memories that are long enough, we know what life was like without democracy. We can neither take it for granted nor neglect the responsibility to refresh its tenets and, and presence and ensure that successive generations of South Africa cherish, cherish it in much the same way. I'd like to conclude with a few thoughts from the Brazilian thinker Roberto Mangabeira Unga, who in his seminal work that he called Empowered Democracy, 
speaks of five necessary institutional innovations. These are raising the temperature of politics, and it's temperature, not the volume. Raising the temperature of politics. Secondly, hastening the pace of politics. Thirdly, combining central power and local initiative. Fourthly, establishing distinct authority to rescue excluded and disadvantaged groups. And finally, gradually enhancing representative democracy through participative democracy. It's surely within our grasp to modernize and effect the necessary changes, if anything. We owe it to the brave and bold decisions of 34 years ago today and to the intensive negotiations that followed to craft our great constitution. Now we, rec now we recognize is the challenge. The challenge for us is to do far more than merely have the constitution. It has to be lived. To live it requires the task of governing within its rules, in the interests of the many. Thank you very much. Raising the temperature, not the noise of democracy. I love it. Uh, we've got a couple of guests there standing at the back. Yes, a couple of seats here, please. You are welcome to occupy before we go over to the next speaker. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Trevor, for uh, absolute uh, in-depth analysis of the state of our democracy and also the advice that you're providing to us in terms of how do we take it forward. And I think one of the takeaways for me is active citizenry. We can talk about, you know, a competent state, and I've been there for many, many years and I've experienced uh, that um, you know the type of people that are often appointed uh, don't really care. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we have to now sit back and accept it. Active citizenry is critical to ensure that our democracy is strengthened. So let me uh, now welcome our um, public protector, Advocate Koleka Kaleka. Please uh, uh, come uh, forward and... Uh, Come and share your thoughts with us. Thank you. Can I get some water? Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. A very good afternoon to Mamu Elita de Klerk. I'm not certain whether to say that to Trevor Manuel. He wasn't too pleasant when he was categorized as a veteran earlier on. Um, his worship of the city in which we are standing today. Uh, Mr. Dave Stewart, board members of the FW de Klerk Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you all. I stand here just reflecting where I was on the 2nd of February, 1990, as an eight-year-old, living in Sophia Town, the domestic quarter where my mother was a domestic worker and my father was a clerk at the Vatterfall municipality. And I was schooling in Westbury Primary School. Homelands are in Umzumkulu, a totally different landscape. When we were in Johannesburg, we lived in a domestic quarter with water and electricity. And when we're back home just once a year, which is what my parents could afford, we lived in a big house with no water and electricity and no road to access the home. 34 years later today, the reflection I will make later on. But this invite 
has made me to actually reflect, introspect, particularly in myself as a public servant in this democratic dispensation. It is my considered view that people from all walks of life in this country are invested in the success of our nation's democratic project and gatherings such as this one, which gives us an opportunity to interact with one another and exchange ideas on how to turn our nation's dream into a reality. I am therefore truly grateful to be a part of this conversation. And of course, we live in the legacies, part of which were left by the former president, F.W. de Klerk. I cannot imagine how difficult it was. As Mr. Trevor Manuel said, just four months into his tenure of presidency, the talks start for a democratic South Africa. Now, to know how far we have come as a nation since the dawn of our democracy, and to know where we want to go, it is necessary for me to just briefly mention that we come from an era of the Immorality Act, the Population Registration Act, through the incredibly infamous Group Areas Act of 1950, the Suppression of Communism Act. South Africa's democratic era was hard fought for, but various civil organization and political formations finally declaring a democratic South Africa. Now, 30 years in, in April, South Africa's constitutional development since 1994 is unique in many ways, but it shares some similarities with various other countries in the globe. The transition from authoritarian rule, like Brazil, Indonesia, and Tunisia, amongst others, and in the case of a transition which involved rigorous negotiations, and of course when negotiations are involved, there has to be comp compromises. The ethnic diversity and nation building, countries such as India, Nigeria, and Malaysia share with South Africa the challenge of managing ethnic diversity and building a cohesive national identity. In each case, the Constitution plays a crucial role in balancing the interests of different ethnic and cultural groups, promoting social cohesion and preventing ethnic conflict. The legacy of colonialism and discrimination, which we cannot forget because it is a foundation of what we see today. Countries like Kenya, Zimbabwe, and Namibia have grappled with similar legacies of colonialism and discrimination as us. And in this case, the Constitution has been used to address historical injustices, promote reconciliation, and empower marginalized communities. Constitutional design and institutions, South Africa's constitutional design, including its systems of checks and balances, separation of powers, the protection of human rights, bears similar to countries such as Colombia, the Philippines, and South Korea, amongst others. And even in this circumstance, the Constitution serves as a framework for democratic governance and the rule of law. Challenges of implementation and enforcement which we face, like many emerging constitutional democracies, South Africa faces challenges in implementing and enforcing its Constitution fully. These challenges include and are not limited to the factors of corruption, weakened institutions, socioeconomic disparities, and resistance from vested interests. Addressing these challenges requires sustained efforts to strengthen democratic institutions, promote accountability, and enhancing the rule of law. 
Now, our post-apartheid socioeconomic transformation efforts pursued by the government on behalf of the people have been substantial, but have fallen short of public expectations for more rapid change. These unmet expectations likely have contributed to section of society increasingly opting out of mechanisms that underpin democracy. From talking toward counselors, complaining to and engaging with institutions supporting democracy, such as the one that I come from, or seeking change through the political processes. Poor living conditions and frustrations arguably are a major factor motivating frequent, sometimes violent, demonstrations known as service protests that have been part of the South African landscape for a number of years now. Many experts have maintained the view that large disparities in access of poor and vulnerable to some of the essential of life are, I quote, a constant and stubborn reminder of the unfinished business of our democratic project, I unquote which amongst others must seek to reverse the legacy of apartheid policies that I quote, continue to underpin rural residents' struggle for social production, I unquote. It is a worrying concern to the public protector as an institution and fellow institutions supporting democracy that so many of the social and economic factors that may constitute some of the underlying causes of the indifferences in the Southern Africa society are still so prominent, including poverty, inequality, and unemployment, incidences of racism exacerbated by the impact of COVID-19 pandemic and levels of corruption and maladministration. According to a new report released by the World Bank, inequality in Southern Africa our rainbow nation is still the world's most unequal country. The report noted that COVID-19 pandemic is having a major impact on South Africa's economy, leading to a 6.4% contraction in 2020, as the pandemic weighed heavily on both external demand, even as the government implemented containment measures. This severe contraction is estimated to increase poverty with two million people living below the poverty line for upper middle income countries. Now, if we look at the categorization of those people, they still remain black predominantly and females in particular. Further, according to the World Bank, race is the largest contributor to inequality and its contribution is growing. The legacy of apartheid continues to exacerbate economic disparities. Differences in educational attainment are the second most important driver in inequality, especially post-secondary and tertiary attainment. Disparities in access to education, which is key to human capital accumulation, contribute about 30% to overall inequality. Disparities in em employment outcomes are the third most important contributor to inequality. Another harsh reality, as I've mentioned earlier, is that women's realities in South Africa are still determined by race, class, and gender-based access to resources and opportunities. This is due to various challenges such as poverty, unemployment, and inequality. We've also seen the sustainable development report drivers in South Africa. Poverty is a social problem that affects both women and men in South Africa, and to a various extent, lit literature has established that many women live below the poverty line more than men. And more households are headed by women. The challenges have been plaguing our country since the advent of the new democratic dispensation. And some of the issues have still not been dealt with head on. The current state of affairs has a degenerative effect on the country's young democratic culture and not only erodes the rights of citizens, but are contributing to the unprecedented levels of frustration 
and loss of trust in the democratic institutions, systems, and processes, which threatens the derail the democratic state. When the program, when one of the speakers actually was introducing the former Minister of Finance, he attributed some of the accolades that he had achieved as the Minister of Finance. We have regressed as a country since then. We are a relatively young and impressionable democracy, and our understanding of constitutional democracy and the rule of law is still developing. However, there are hindrances along the way. When governance and accountability and subsequently the relationship between citizens and the state is weak, this leads to an opt-out strategy, which citizens withdrawing from state services Within such dysfunctional relations, citizens may totally opt out of the democratic accountability processes altogether and articulate their needs and demands through protest action and civil unrest, which we continue to see. Despite often large investments and concerted policy efforts to improve things such as housing, public services in their generally infrastructure and the state's technical capacities, the delivery of public goods and services remains disconcertedly inequal and, and, and inadequate. Such problems disproportionately affect the most vulnerable members of our population which not surprisingly also suffer from particular high rates of unemployment and low educational attainments. Unfortunately, we become the institution that, get, that gets to see this. According to our statistics, it is clear that the state of our country has a high rate of maladministration, abuse of power, conduct failure, undue delay. Now this threatens our democratic values, part of them of an accountable and a responsive government. However, it is promising to have seen the recent statistics re released by the Statistician General, which shows an improvement in the lives of the people. Great improvement in the provision of electricity, whether it's lit or not, <laughs> even in water and housing. Now the living conditions in South Africa is that the social grants are on the increase. Personally, I do not think that is something to be proud of as a country. It is what leads to the decline in economy because it means that we are becoming a social state with most unemployed, underdeveloped, Sanitation has also improved, but whether we are in a state where we say we've restored the dignity of the majority of South Africans, we cannot say so. Although South Africa has made progress in reducing poverty since 1994, the trajectory of poverty reduction was reversed between 2011 and 2015, threatening to erode some of the gains made since our democratic dispensation. Approximately 55.5% of the population is still living in poverty at the national upper poverty line, while a total of 13.8 million people, 25%, are experiencing food poverty. Poverty, nonetheless, remains a key development challenge in social, economic, and political terms, not only in our country, but it is what most of the developing world is struggling with. In post-apartheid South Africa, fighting the legacy of poverty and underdevelopment has always been a central theme of government. This was cemented in the Reconstruction and Developmental Plan and the National Development Plan. However, what still remains a concern and probably part of the systemic challenges that we are facing is the issue of the equitable share model. It still finds that majority of the population migrates to the cities to seek a better life. 
clogging the infrastructure, development of informal settlements, and further poor living conditions in the cities. Whilst the rural areas still remain where the women and children are and the elderly, struggling for a better life. With municipalities that do not have the share to afford to improve the conditions and create jobs in rural areas. Unintentionally, this kind of model still perpetuates the intentions of the apartheid regime. When we look at our governance system in South Africa, South Africa has held successful free and fair elections since its transition into democracy. Several sources highlight the negotiation period that heralded the transition and the importance of it for the establishment of a democratic culture in which electoral outcomes and basic political rights are respected. The transition is viewed positively in these accounts and considered as the anchor of South Africa's democratic political culture. However, if you look at our standing today and reflecting on a video which we viewed two days ago at the Legislative Sector Summit of the negotiations, the vigor, the passion, the consultation which we, the transition was handled. If only we could just have, even if it's half of that, in our governance system today. South Africa's government has continued to implement varied programs aimed at creating social cohesion and nation building, yet social conflict persists, eroding the legitimacy of government and the broader politic. However, this is caused by the characteristics that have embedded our governance in our government. The details of how this phenomenon developed have been extensively reported, but the main takeaway here is the corrosive impact of state capture, as previously mentioned, and societal relations. State capture presented characteristics of a state that didn't fall short of living or taking lessons on some of the former systems of this country, colonialism and apartheid, which took from its people. We saw that also repeating itself during the COVID pandemic, when there was not even a consciousness that people's lives are at stake, the livelihood and the right to life is at stake. The looting continued. We have witnessed and experienced that citizens and communities are not only frustrated by their socioeconomic circumstances, but by poor service delivery, standard and quality of the service delivery, by leadership and lack of good governance by particularly the local authorities. Indicators of public dissatisfaction, particularly in municipality, have included several violent service delivery protests. Now, this is another saddening phenomenon in our country where infrastructure is being destroyed. Now, looking at the significant part of the mandate and the mission of the public protector, which we too will be celebrating our 30 year existence next year. We are not too proud even of our own legacy. However, we are rebuilding and efforts are being made because the public protector was established particularly to redress the imbalances of the past, to represent those who do not have the financial muscle and even the voice to represent themselves. We are regarded as the pillars of this democracy to strengthen it and to support it. Now looking at the service delivery aspects, as I've mentioned earlier, the statistician general says there is improvements. We however continue to issue reports and one of them has been the report into the state of service delivery in the Eastern Cape, which gives us a picture that we cannot be very proud of. 
where human beings still drink in dams where animals drink definitely cannot be a democratic dispensation that we are proud of. Though we have made strides, we need to acknowledge that a lot still needs to be done. But I think the critical question that we need to ask ourselves as a citizenry, is it only government's responsibility to improve our lives? The ordinary people of this country continue to trust institutions such as ours, but also have a heavy reliability on civil society, business, investors into this country to also play their part, but most importantly, to assist in holding the government accountable, to ensure that we've got a responsive government and there's openness and transparency in our democratic system. We are thankful in South Africa for having a free media, which at least assists in transparency and openness in, in our country. Yes, with its limitations too, there is no system that is perfect. However, pulling together in ensuring that we realize what is envisaged in our constitution, particularly the rights, human dignity, quality, the right to life. <clears throat> when we look at the report that we issued as the public protector, the state of the healthcare system in South Africa, can we say that the right to life is being upheld? When the lives of those are still in rural areas, poor areas, is not equal as the right to life of those who are abled. Now, the endemic levels of corruption, which is one of the major factors that we can attribute the state at which we are at, of course, not forgetting where we come from. Hadn't it been for corruption, the malfeasance that have characterized our democratic dispensation, which of course that our democracy borrowed from the previous dispensations of this country, the lives of the people of South Africa would have been in a far better state in, than what we currently report. Now in attaining the vision of the Constitution as the foundation of our democracy, in bettering the lives of the people. Our constitution is a blueprint to a better life for all. It is the vanguard that protects the citizens from the people who are placed in power and indeed the citizens from one another. It serves as the supreme law of the land while simultaneously, I must add quite masterfully, echoing, as I quote, never again message. That is what the Constitution is about, that never again shall the people who are on the soil of South Africa be in the same position in which they were before. Can we confidently say that is the state of affairs currently? What needs to be done? From the perspective of the PPSA, it is absolutely crucial that citizens are able to respond to service or conduct failures by the state in a manner that reinforces institutions such as ours. The values as prescribed in our constitution, our ethical values and justice, social justice and economic justice attainment. It was through the erosion of the human character that we find ourselves in the position in which we are in. Hence, I agree that it is important that the people become a major contributor in who represents them. It is amongst the people in our society that our leaders come, and most of them elected, being known in those societies of not being people of character. So it is important that indeed our democratic dispensation sees itself at play 
by the involvement of the people, public participation, particularly as we move forward to the elections. Compliance with and respect of the rule of law. We have seen, even in this democratic dispensation, we've been grappling with the concept of compliance, particularly on the aspects of the rule of law. But as we move forward, without speaking on the next topic, it is important that we actually look at the ethical standing of our society. It is not written. It doesn't have a prescript. It doesn't have a legislation. We need to put in measures where the highest standard is that of character, not even the rule of law. The rule of law is prescribed. And now, mostly know how to comply without necessarily being of character and without necessarily doing what is good and without necessarily producing work which is ethical. Agenda and the call for action in the protection of promoting human rights. Even in the selection of public servants, both at the political and administrative level, it is critical that society scrutinizes and ensures that it is agents of this democracy who drive its aspirations. Now more than ever, these agents need to drive these aspirations with urgency. We cannot be at a more urgent and critical period, but now. In conclusion, allow me to acknowledge that South Africa cannot be described as a nation which has reached its full potential. And certainly, there is much to be said about what we all think and causes of that may be. The indicators of dissatisfaction and disappointment by the populace are well documented and certainly justified. It is up to us and how well we collaborate to continue to leverage on the good and courageous work in order to diminish the bad and the ugly. Good can only prevail over bad when we hold each other accountable to ensure good governance and ethical choices that will enhance our humanity. In gatherings such as these, we need not only share our experiences and thoughts, but to come up with sustainable solutions for a better future in a South Africa that is free from all the bad we have highlighted. In all of this, we must remain mindful that even with all that we have achieved, there remain considerable deficits in overcoming the legacy of discrimination and the grinding effects of poverty. The evidence of this confronts us with frequent regularity and the challenge we face as an institution and as a people is to ensure that the promise of the Constitution is made good and realized in substantial terms by the people. On 10 May 1994, in a cere ceremony that filled people across South Africa and around the world with hope, Nelson Mandela was sworn in as the President of the Republic of South Africa. He was not only South Africa's black, first black president, but also the first president chosen in a competitive free and fair elections. And in his inaugural address, Madiba declared, I quote, we have triumphed in the effort of implant hope in the breast of millions of our people. We enter into a covenant that we shall build the society in which all South Africans, both black and white, will be able to walk tall without any fear in their hearts, assured of their alienable right to human dignity, a rainbow nation at peace with itself and the world. The time for the healing of the wounds has come. The moment to bridge the chasms that divide us has come. The time to build is upon us, I unquote. As a country and as a nation, we can pride ourselves that we've been working hard and building. Our challenges remain because perhaps we might be underestimating 
the time it would take to dismantle the legacy of the past that brought us here. But through the recent crisis times that we as a nation had to endure, I have also witnessed our resilience, our drive, and our courage to build our new democratic dem South Africa, which is still a relatively short period of time in the history of nations. With our eyes firmly focused on the values and principles of our constitution as our strongest foundation, I'm in closing again reminded by Madiba's words in 1999 where he states, I quote, we have cause to draw inspiration from what South Africans can do. We dare to hope for a brighter future because we are prepared to work for it. The steady progress of the past few years has laid the foundation for greater achievements, but the reality is that we can do much, much better, I end quote. Thank you. Thank you very much for highlighting all the unfinished business in terms of our democratic uh, project. Uh, yes, poverty, abject poverty, uh, all the issues related to it poses a real threat to our democracy. Thank you for highlighting that. And also for the assurance that you are fixing the public protector because you've got such a critical role to fulfill. But I think what you also highlight is the fact that our constitution serves as the blueprint. It's the recipe. It's there. If you use that recipe, we can ensure that the cake that we built uh, or that we bake, that that cake is edible. That cake is not a flop. But what we're currently experiencing is a deviation from that blueprint. No wonder we sit with all the issues that you've highlighted. But I think just to link what uh, Trevor has mentioned, the important role of a competent state. We require a competent state to make sure that we um, finish all the unfinished businesses that you have referred to earlier in terms of our democratic project. Thank you very much for your contribution today. It's now my honor, ladies and gentlemen, and just before we start, we have left a few pages on each seat, which you can, if you want to ask a question later, please, you can write that question down. Not a speech, just a short question. We will collect it, and then uh, we will obviously, um, during the panel discussion, pose those questions to uh, our esteemed uh, speakers. It's now my honor to welcome uh, Jordan Hill Lewis, our executive mayor. Welcome, sir. Uh, can we discuss that rates and tax bill? That, uh, <laughs> that's a joke. Thank you. It's going up, I'm afraid. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and, and in particular, Mrs. de Klerk. What a great honor to have been invited to speak here today and to share the stage with such distinguished company. These conversations about the state of our country and the paths we might choose are incredibly important, and particularly in 2024, a watershed year for South Africa. It really is a big year for our country. The Economist tells us that 64 countries around the world are having an election this year, and more than 4 billion people are going to the polls. And some big ones among those 64, but it does feel like this one might just be the most important of them all, or certainly one of the most interesting. We are having our 30th birthday, as you know, and we are having our seventh national election. And there really is a growing sense that our country stands at a crossroads. My sincere hope is that this translates into increased interest and participation in the democratic process when we go to the polls later this year. And in that regard, let me take this opportunity to remind you that this weekend is the final registration weekend ahead of the, uh, ahead of the national election. A whole generation has now passed since South Africans voted in 1994. The first cohort of born frees have now grown up 
and have started families of their own. Young South Africans who were just of voting age and took their ID books down to voting stations for the very first time back in 1994, excited to make their mark and excited at the enormous possibility for change, if they were 18 at the time, they're now approaching their mid-50s. Many of their children are now voting for the first time. I was seven years old at the time of the 1994 uh, first election, and I don't remember it, I'm afraid. I remember the 10th of May, as, as the advocate was referring to. Uh, I remember the, the inauguration of President Mandela very much, but I think it was more related to all of the uh, military aeroplanes that flew over <laughs> that I loved watching on, on TV and, and remember that very, very clearly. But this passage of time, a whole generation, feels like an appropriate period over which to judge our progress since then, to take stock of the ground we've covered so far and to speak about the challenges and opportunities we face today and to consider which path into the future we might choose. It's also, of course, very fitting to do so on the 2nd of February, on the anniversary of the parliamentary speech that began the formal process of dismantling apartheid and negotiating a brand new democracy. When former State President F.W. de Klerk stood in front of the National Assembly for the opening of Parliament 34 years ago today, in 1990, he delivered a message that our country desperately needed, but which not everyone was ready to hear. Branded a traitor to his people by those in his own party who stormed out, he became a divisive figure to some, but a unifier to so many millions more. And at a, time, at a time of great change throughout the world at that time, and in Eastern Europe in particular, his address would become one of the pivotal moments in the process that would ultimately bring about the Rainbow Nation, the world's miracle democracy. I sincerely hope that in the future there will be a wider appreciation of just how much of a political miracle that was. If one looks at all of the current conflicts, many of them seemingly intractable around the world, since 1990 and even today, the key feature of many of those conflicts is that they lack the kind of transformational leadership that South Africa enjoyed in the early 90s to end them once and for all and to negotiate a better future. Much of his speech that day was about the organizations that were going to be unbanned, most notably the ANC, the prisoners that were to be released, most notably Nelson Mandela and changes around emergency regulations, media restrictions, and the death penalty. But I want to just draw your attention to a short passage near the start of the speech, in which he implored his fellow parliamentarians and the country the following. Let's put petty, or let us rather put petty politics aside when we discuss the future. Help us build a broad consensus about the fundamentals of a new, realistic, and democratic dispensation let us work together on a plan that will rid our country of suspicion and steer it away from domination and radicalism of any kind." End quote. He knew that things like ego, power, and suspicion were the biggest threats to finding a lasting negotiated solution for our country. And so he focused up front on the importance of working together and trying to find common ground. And he would return to that theme of cooperation later in the speech and many times thereafter. Addressing the broader South African community and other political movements, always asking for an end to hostility and violence, and the replacement of slogans with deliberate and considered debate, saying that the time for reconstruction and development had arrived. He then listed what he considered, this is now in the 2nd of February speech, he listed what he considered to be the aims of this period ahead, aims which he said should be acceptable to all reasonable South Africans. And they included, and I quote, a new democratic constitution, universal franchise, no domination, equality before an independent judiciary, the protection of minorities and individual rights, freedom of religion, a sound economy based on proven economic principles and private enterprise, Dynamic programs aimed at better education, health services, housing, and social conditions for all. 
Looking back at the past 30 years, we can proudly say as a nation that many of those aims have indeed been achieved. South Africa is an indescribably better place than it was 34 years ago. Our constitution is held up as one of those, the most progressive and well-crafted in the world. We live in a country with political freedom, with firm protections for individual and minority rights, with a free press, an independent judiciary, and the freedom to worship in whichever way you choose. Recently, this was highlighted to me in the, in the travails of, of a fantastic South African journalist, Ms. Karen Morn. We all are familiar with the story. She was challenged, taken on by a powerful former president who tried to silence her writing, uh, her incisive and, and, uh, and uncovering writing, shall we say, that he, he tried to silence her by taking her to court and even trying to prosecute her and trying to bankrupt her through legal fees. And through it all, what impressed me was that even competitor media firms and competitor journalists and editors rose vocally to her defense. And throughout it all, there was a strong sense, I don't know if this was just my strong sense, maybe the optimist uh, in me speaking, but there was really a strong sense that there would be no other outcome than the full dismissal by the courts of those frivolous lawsuits. But it's those last two points that he mentioned, a sound economy and all the social programs and services enabled by such an economy, where none of us can surely deny that we have missed the mark and by a long, long way. South Africa's economy is in a dire position, strangled by a perfect storm of bad policy, shrinking revenue, ballooning debt, and a crippling energy crisis. And as a result of this, the state's capacity to maintain, let alone improve, its service delivery to its citizens has been significantly eroded. Our real national unemployment figure is 40%, with an ever-increasing number of South Africans dependent on social welfare to survive. And I completely agree with the advocate that this massive and growing number of grant recipients is not a government success. The simple reality is that you cannot fund doing enough for the poor and an expanding redistribution pro uh, program with shrinking revenue. The maths does not work. You must have growth to fund more support for the poor who need it. When we look at the growing sense of hopelessness of the now 11 million South Africans without work, when we look at the crumbling state of public infrastructure in so many towns and cities, and the impact this has on the dignity, particularly the dignity of the poorest residents, and on their health and on their safety, we all know that this is not the country that the 1994 generation envisaged three decades ago. This was made clearer, or I was reminded uh, of this distinctly a couple of weeks ago when I went and spent some time doing a neighborhood watch patrol in, in, in Kailicha, in a part of Kailicha, where between 40 and 50 volunteers spend time every single day patrolling from the local uh, taxi and bus station for those who are coming home from work because they are particularly vulnerable to, to thieves who know that they might have cell phones and, and money coming home from work. And here, 40 or 50 volunteers who, who patrol every day helping get people home from the bus station to their, to their homes. And I spent some time talking with them, and what really struck me was between 40 and 50 mainly young people. There was one elderly person who had uh, suffered a work injury and, and who were, walked with a, with a hobble, but for the rest, almost all of them were young South Africans. Not a single one of them had an income, not one. And that is in a city where unemployment is 15 percentage points lower than the national average. So our economy is in a very, very tough spot. The only way to get out of this is through a growing economy that brings work, that brings tax revenue for the state to do more for the poor, and that brings the ability of the state to invest in infrastructure that is able to meet the demands of the future. If we all agree on this, and I hope we do, 
then perhaps it's worth revisiting that part of Mr. de Klerk's speech from 34 years ago, where he called for cooperation, real debate, and an end to the political hostilities that so often get in the way of progress. If we can settle on a shared, realistic future ambition for our country, and if we agree that the only way to unlock that future is through a rapidly growing economy, then surely we can also agree to put our current political divisions aside in order to pursue that goal. The window for doing so will not be open forever, and in fact is closing fast as the social conditions across the country deteriorate. And all the while waiting in the long grass, ready to pounce and profit politically from the disillusion and frustration of poor South Africans who see no hope ahead, are people who do not share the same future ambition for our country and who peddle in the politics of hate and division and even in violence. And they will turn that frustration, that growing frustration, into anger as they bide their time waiting for the right opportunity. That is why we need to find our consensus now, those of us who want our country to work and grow the center so that the radical fringes remain just that, fringes. I strongly believe that we have the people and the talent to do so. I believe that the overwhelming majority of South Africans do not want violence and chaos in our future. And I believe that the overwhelming majority of South Africans would choose the dignity of work and the hope that that brings over the struggle of the economy we have now. So our task now is to ensure that this majority unites around a common goal and a shared future ambition for our country. If we allow political one-upmanship to stand in the way, we will not realize that ambition and we will open the door to those who thrive on division and chaos. We can and we must succeed, and I know it can be done. However, the often chaotic coalition governments of some of our country's governments have made many South Africans skeptical about such a future era of cooperation. But let me remind you with a local perspective that Cape Town too had a very turbulent seven-party coalition more than a decade ago, and that government was somehow made to work. And from that very rocky soil and tough start, Cape Town has steadily built a reputation as a city that is making progress in more ways than one. It is a city that's making progress for its residents through improved service delivery and favorable conditions in which to operate a business and invest. It's a city where more people find work than anywhere else in South Africa, with an unemployment rate, as I said, 15 percentage points below the national average. Of course, that's not to say that everything in Cape Town is uh, perfect, far, far from it. We grapple with all of the same big issues that all fast-growing cities in developing world contexts do. High rates of poverty, high unemployment, rapid urbanization, as the advocate referred to, inadequate supply of affordable housing, crime, vandalism, and of course, the national energy crisis. But there are things that are headed in the right direction and which perhaps offer some guidance on the way forward for our country. Here we are investing in public infrastructure at a scale not seen before in our city, nor anyone else, anywhere else in our country, rather. And we're able to fund this investment without placing undue pressure or burden on the ratepayers, but rather through the revenue base of a city that is growing its local economy. We know how fast our city is changing through urbanization and semigration. Our recent national census confirmed that Cape Town is now the biggest city in South Africa, five million people, bigger than uh, just overtaking Johannesburg. Within a generation, it will be a metro of 10 million people. That is a big number and potentially a daunting prospect. But rather than be fearful of that future or be paralyzed by it, I'm determined to meet that head on by doing all that we can now to prepare for it. And so we take a long view in everything that we do. We are trying to change the 
government planning horizon from the short and at the very best the medium term to the long term. We look a whole generation into the future in terms of demographics, spatial development, climate and environmental resilience, water and energy security, housing and safety, and then we plan for the future that we want. I believe that our obsessive future focus is not only the path to success for our metro, but offers some insights into how we may fix the future for our country. And I hope that by showing our val its value here, we can demonstrate everywhere why it's so crucial to follow a similar approach. And so as we take time today to reflect on the first 30 years of our democracy and to look ahead to the next 30, I thought the best value that I can add to this discussion is to share with you some of the approaches to governance that I believe will make a difference to setting South Africa on a different trajectory and which are not entirely new to South Africa because they are being tried and tested in some local and provincial governments. I consider these to be universal truths and I believe that their application at any sphere of government will have a similar outcome. If these principles will help make Cape Town of 2054 or 2084 or beyond a place of opportunity and dignity and safety, what we refer to as the city of hope, then there is no reason why the same approach would not turn South Africa into the country of hope we all know and believe it can be, and which it once was in those wonderful days of, of the mid-90s. The first of these is the need to define a bold sense of national ambition. This is very important to us. We have to be able to answer the question, what are we aiming for as a country? And I think we can best illustrate the problem by simply asking in our room here today, can any of us describe simply what South Africa's national ambition is? I don't think any of us could. We have to set out clearly what kind of country we want to be. And to his great credit, the former minister tried to do exactly that through the National Development Plan. Sadly, it has not been taken up with the vigor that it should have been taken up as a sense of national ambition at a national level. But I would suggest to you, minister, that you can find evidence of its implementation elsewhere. <laughs> we don't have a clarifying, motivating sense of national ambition. In the absence of such an ambition, and against the backdrop of growing poverty and the increasing neglect of the state and its infrastructure, people, and this is what uh, hurts me the most, is that people are becoming acclimatized to deterioration. South Africans have become, begun to accept that this is a kind of new normal that for the last 15 years, our country has only had a reverse gear, that neglect is permanent, or that the damage is too far gone to fix. There was a wonderful insult hurled in uh, the British House of Commons at a, a rapidly departing uh, prime minister who had, lost, who had lost a vote, and someone from across the aisle shouted, he has a great future behind him. <laughs> Let it never be said of South Africa that we have a great future behind us. I refuse to believe that. And I refuse to accept that our country is stuck forever in reverse gear. My colleagues and I spend a lot of time talking about what the future can and should look like. And in doing so, we are explicitly trying to create an ambition for our city and for our society that everyone can share. That's an important part of our project. And that makes our project a massive group effort and leads to an incredible level of buy-in and partnership with residents, businesses, and civil society. So I think this is a critical first step for our country too. If we want to achieve a better future, we must start by defining what that future looks like so that everyone is energized and mobilized to pull in that direction. The second universal truth is that you cannot make progress in society and build for the future without a merit-based state. And others have mentioned this today. 
And by this, I want to say explicitly that you cannot prioritize party loyalty over expertise when it comes to staffing the state. A glance at any of our failing state-owned enterprises or dysfunctional municipalities across the country demonstrates this very clearly. Probably the most important single intervention and difference that we have made in Cape Town is to set about the task many years ago of professionalizing the civil service and reintroducing the idea of a public service as an excellent career choice for ambitious candidates. This has been an absolutely critical part, perhaps the most critical part, of turning the city around and allowing us to think about the future. And it's a virtuous cycle too. As your reputation as a place of excellence grows, so too does your ability to attract better talent. Today, this is perhaps one of the only remaining parts of the civil service in South Africa that is considered a highly desirable place to work. And we've been able to fill positions with people of outstanding quality in their fields. And this has enabled us to dramatically expand our capacity to deliver. This has to be the way forward for our country too. It will be of no use to define a bold national ambition if the state is not able to deliver on that ambition as it is presently not able to do. Professional merit has to be the only criteria for filling positions in the state, not political loyalty. My third lesson is that power is best located closer to those people who will benefit from its proper exercise. And the converse is true as well. So that if that power is not properly exercised and they suffer the consequences thereof, they have the direct democratic route of accountability to hold those responsible accountable. So the third lesson is that we should actively look to decentralize power to energetic, active, local and provincial governments for the future of South Africa. And perhaps this differs with the point of, uh, I just want to get his name, Mr. Mr. Unger, who said central power with local initiative. I would say decentralized power to enable local initiative uh, is going to be, but, but maybe that's what he meant. I don't know. I, I, haven't, I haven't read it. But we must enable active, energetic local and provincial governments to do what they can where they have demonstrated capacity to do so, to build alternative policy platforms, to test and experiment with different ideas, and to demonstrate alternative pathways for the future. My fourth universal truth for prosperous and growing South Africa is something I briefly touched on earlier, and that is investing for the future through a massive focus on public infrastructure. Failure to do so comes with devastating consequences, as we are now seeing in so many towns and cities in South Africa, where the infrastructure, particularly water and sanitation infrastructure, which goes so uh, centrally to the issue of people's dignity, is starting to crumble, crack, and collapse, and cannot cope with the demand. Once this, happen, once this happens, once the future arrives and you are ill-prepared, it's then very hard to catch up. Our biggest obsession here is to avoid that scenario from ever happening and to stay ahead of the curve. And so whether it be laying and replacing sewer pipes, upgrading wastewater treatment plants and pump stations and securing new sources of clean potable water at a scale that dwarfs every other city in the country, we are trying to get ahead of that population growth pressure curve. Just to put that scale into perspective, our infrastructure spend in this city over the next three years is more than that of Johannesburg and Durban combined, and more than the next five smaller cities combined. And it's not just water and sanitation, although that's obviously the focus for, for reasons of, of better dignity and better service, particularly in poorer communities. But we're also putting huge allocations into our electricity grid and into the procurement of power so that we can stop the load shedding that is uh, the biggest handbrake on South Africa's economy. We're ramping up visible policing. 
We're rolling out in partnership with social housing companies, more affordable housing, and we're investing heavily in cleaning up our, what the future of our city is going to look like already, and we're determined to be ready for it. And we're now looking ahead at the next 30 years in South Africa, and we want to be in a position not only to meet the massive challenges of population growth and urbanization, the census now confirms for the first time that the majority of South Africa lives in its eight biggest cities, and that trend is only going to accelerate. But indeed, we want to turn those challenges into our competitive advantage. And so we're doing the groundwork today. Not only does investment in public infrastructure deliver more dignified services for communities, it also sends a signal to the world that we are the, a solid bet for the future, and it attracts business investment that grows more and more jobs. And that brings me to my final universal truth for progress and prosperity, and that is the power of economic growth. You cannot have ambitions for the improvement of communities. You cannot have ambitions for lowering poverty or getting people into work. You cannot speak of a plan to improve basic services, to better public transport, to make South Africa safer, or give more people access to affordable housing. You cannot speak of any of these things if you do not have the economic growth to pay for it. You must have growth. Redistribution without growth is a one-way ticket to state bankruptcy. In Cape Town, we managed to run the most redistributive government in the country, and that is often uh, a surprise to many people. And when we lay out the facts and show all of our budget figures and where we spend them, people sometimes struggle to believe it. But it is the most redistributive government in South Africa, with a full 73% of our entire budget spend going directly to poorer communities in Cape Town and informal settlements. But the truth is that we are only able to do that because we have a city economy that is growing. And so our revenue base is growing and providing us with the resources necessary to improve the quality of people's lives step by step over time. And so all of the progress depends on this. And that's why we're obsessed with throwing open the doors to business and investment uh, and the private sector in Cape Town. That's why we've said our mission is to make Cape Town the easiest place to do business on the entire African continent. And we regard the city's business owners, entrepreneurs, and investors as the job-creating heroes of this mission. I will tell one brief story about, uh, about Parliament. When I came to Parliament, uh, uh, Mr. Manuel had already uh, left by then. And when you go to Parliament, you become what is called a backbencher, where you sit right at the back and you're not really allowed to talk unless you're spoken to. And, uh, and Mr. Manuel had then gone uh, off to, to run the National Development Plan. And my job as a, as a junior spokesperson on trade and industry was to focus on the chapter dealing, on, uh, dealing with the, the ease of doing business. And I can tell you, with some sense of pride, I can remember every single one of the prescriptions uh, that you set out in that chapter. And sadly, very, very few of them have ever been implemented. But here we have published for the first time a ease of doing business index for the city of Cape Town because the World Bank stopped theirs a couple of years ago after the numbers were being manipulated, it turned out, by the Chinese government. And uh, we, so we said we, we want to hold ourselves publicly accountable for, for being an easier place to do business, in fact, the easiest place on the African continent, and have now published our own ease of doing business index, which we publish uh, annually, we're going to publish annually, we've just published the first edition of it, and it's available for, for all of you to read. And it takes all of those prescriptions, nothing really new, all of those prescriptions from that chapter and implements them right here in a way that makes us more globally competitive and attractive to private investment and thereby more jobs for more people in our city. That is a lesson that everyone in South Africa is going to have to take heart, take to heart if we're going to pull our economy out of its slump. We must reduce our high unemployment rate and fund the kind of investment and support for our country that we need by focusing resolutely on growth. 
I'm of the firm belief that if we apply these five principles at a national level, if we clearly express a bold national ambition that all of us can describe in no more than a few sentences, if we make professional merit the only criteria for appointments, if we devolve power to energetic and active local and provincial governments with a demonstrated capacity, if we ramp up our investment in infrastructure, and if we prioritize growth over everything else, then we can put our country on the trajectory of success over the next 30 years. We know that we can do that because this is exactly the recipe we are following, and it is showing encouraging results. Of course, we still have many big challenges, and life is still far too harsh for many of our poorest residents. But all the critical metrics are moving in the right direction rather than the wrong direction. And that is always the way of social progress all over the world, step by step in the right direction. Our city is the single biggest source of new jobs in South Africa. In the last quarter reported by St St Statistics South Africa, Cape Town created more new jobs than all seven other metros combined. We are the biggest spenders on public infrastructure in South Africa. We have the widest access to basic services and the biggest basket of free services for indigent residents in South Africa. Our property market is booming. Our skyline is dotted with construction cranes as investment rolls in. We've just been named the second best city in the world to visit by Time Out and CNN just after New York City. We continue to set ourselves ambitious annual targets in our mission to deliver on the idea of a city of hope. And I'm very proud to say that those targets are all being met and more often than not surpassed. And while this is incredibly important for the residents of Cape Town and for the future of our city, I hope you can see that I'm not actually making a point about Cape Town because all of these lessons are critically important to South Africans everywhere. The whole point of what we are trying to do is to show that decline in our country is not inevitable. We do not have to become acclimatized to decline. We do not have to lower our gaze and accept that this is the new normal. We must prove to South Africans everywhere that you do not have to accept the prospect of few opportunities in life. You can still be optimistic about South Africa. You can still believe that the future is going to be better for you and your family and your children. And you are allowed to want more for yourself and dream bigger for the future. So for all of us who believe in that very deeply and who believe in the future of South Africa, the dream of 1994 is still very much alive and very much worth pursuing and working for. And I sincerely hope that when we meet here together in another 30 years' time, and may you all be here, <laughs> when we meet together in another 30 years' time and do our 60-year review as a country, that the work that we are doing today and the examples that we are setting today will have helped put South Africa on the road to prosperity. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, for giving us such a lot of hope. And it's indeed inspiring. And also, thank you for reminding us about the important role of transformational leadership. I often, you know, when we talk and engage with people, I said, uh, when President Leclerc and President Mandela, when they met, they put their personal interests aside. They prioritized the country's interests. And that's what transformational leadership is all about. And um, I think um, you're right, we should not be desperate or find ourselves in a state of hopelessness. So Africa remains a great place. And um, as long as the cent holds, I think that's critical. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, um, we've, as the foundation, had our strategic session last year. And yesterday we also met and uh, we discussed our own operational plans as a foundation. And then we've agreed to a vision because everything stands and falls with your vision. We said to each other, let's work towards a constitutional democracy that is a reality for all South Africans. In other words, mooie Afrikaans, kom ons vestig a grondwetlike democracy, wat de werkelijkheid is for alle South Africans. This point in time, for many South Africans, our constitutional democracy is not the reality. And how do we then position ourselves as a foundation to achieve that objective? And today we extend our hand to you as the mayor of Cape Town, to you as the public protector, to Trevor Manuel. Uh, and our role is to see what we can do to achieve the, that reality on behalf of all of our people. Ladies and gentlemen, on that note, we will now have a tea break. And let me just check my time, because the mayor stole about five minutes. But <laughs> we grant him that. Uh, we will be back, uh, let me see, at, um, uh, let's make it uh, 16.30, half past four. And then we can return. We will then have a very nice panel discussion. The three of you will be seated here in front. Where are my two colleagues, uh, Daniela Ellerbeck, as well as Ismail Yusuf? They will then assist me with asking particular questions. So please make use of the little a memo that we left there on the chairs to just write down your question. But please, uh, enjoy your tea break, and when you come back, we will then engage uh, very constructively. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, can we please take up our seats again? Dames en heren, kom ons en neem ons sitplekken in. I then just call on um, our keynote speakers to take up their seats here in front. Um, advocate, you are welcome to sit anywhere. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think this afternoon is quite historic in the sense that we've heard various perspectives, various interpretations, uh, various realities, but more so, also solutions for the challenges that we face as a country. And we do have uh, leaders, uh, caliber leaders, that uh, can assist us in uh, taking our country forward. I am going to ask each of them, perhaps, just to respond to uh, the issues raised by fellow speakers, and they're also welcome to ask a, a few questions to each other. Um, and the idea is that we then also uh, allow my two colleagues, Daniela, as well as Ishmael, to um, if there's any questions being raised from the floor, just to accommodate that. We haven't received any written uh, questions at this point in time, or do we? Okay, all right. Perhaps the two of you can then just uh, step forward uh, and then pose the questions from here. Okay, let me start with uh, Advocate. Your views on what has been said this afternoon, things that you differ from, things that you perhaps uh, what is you? Over to you. We give you five minutes, uh, not to repeat of your speech, but just to perhaps uh, comment on what has been said. Thank you. Um, just a reflection. I mean, I think we are greatly privileged to have amongst us somebody who's been a part, you know, of this road to power even before the democratic dispensation took its power. And uh, my reflection really is what could have gone wrong? At which point did it go wrong? Uh, when the constitution was negotiated, and which is what I always ask myself, did the writers not foresee that at some point we will get to this curve of the road. Um, further, and maybe I'm just being theoretical, how have we found ourselves from your 2011 to 2015, later on, and even at a deeper sense where the capacity and the capability of the state is eroding. Yes, we acknowledge the legacy built. Was it strong enough? Did we have sufficient succession planning? Did we have, or probably we thought everybody would, would be in good faith? Were the systems strong enough, or were those who came after strong enough to erode those systems? Uh, a lot had been done. A lot is being done, and we are hoping a lot is still to be done. But maybe if we could just have a glimpse of if, Mr. Emanuel, you were the Minister of Finance today, and, and without critiquing the, the current Minister of Finance, looking at the contribution of National Treasury in assisting on a technical basis 
on the economic outlook of our country, what do you think should be done? If you could assist us. But also, institutions such as ours, I do not for a moment believe that the public protector is either just a security or a social institution. I believe that we've got a critical role to play in assisting to, to grow the economy through our governance reforms. What better can our institutions do? On the perspective of the last speaker, even from our part as the public protector, we do believe that, and data shows that, Cape Town, particularly the Western Cape, is most responsive. Uh, you've shared your pointers of how you perceive the future, but just practically, what can be shared for a more responsive government and government? Um, from our work, what concerns me, and with all the responsiveness, and is is the, which I've mentioned earlier, the share of revenue that goes into the marginalized areas. And through our work, your Kayeli Chakukule to Langa are obviously areas of concern. Now, not just for the city of Cape Town or the Western Cape, but how better can the country tackle uh, the marginalization of townships and rural areas in particular in order to curb this rapid um, migration into cities, which is causing a major challenge? So what perspective can we look at? Because even from our side, we try to do some systemic investigations and see what are the systemic issues that we can assist with um, from all fronts and all factors in our country? But I think some form of sharing on that because it, it is one area that we grapple with. Um, the reality is in our country, those who are poor are becoming poorer. Of course, we've had other external factors, unforeseen factors that have intervened in that. But I think uh, from the reflections, what still characterizes our democracy is the past. How do we heal from the past? From what I said, Nelson Mandela had envisaged a past that's going to heal. And uh, from Mr. Hill Lewis's speech is that former President F.W. de Klerk wanted the pettiness to be set aside, but the focus to be on the generations to come in building South Africa. Now we see the coalition governments and probably we'll see even more of that into the future. So we really need to come together and, and end the pettiness and put uh, the future of the country forward. I've tried to, to contact other countries, other public protector-like institutions in other countries to establish how do they deal with the issue of coalition governments in ensuring that uh, there's good governance and there's service delivery in the midst of the political uncertainty. And the countries I've spoken to, they've all said the same thing. They said politicians need to negotiate in good faith. So how do we instill good faith as a people and how do we ensure that um, we elect politicians who would serve in good faith, who will put the pettiness aside and who will not negotiate on what the individual political party would be getting but rather how is each who's coming to the table going to better the lives of the people in South Africa? Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, I will now ask um, um, Trevor to respond, and then the mayor. Trevor, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, PP. Um, the, a couple of issues. The first, the first observation relates to the Constitution. It's negotiated. And negotiations don't produce perfect outcomes. And, and, I mean, there are a couple of issues. I mean, uh, apropos, apropos the mayor's point about uh, uh, where power vests. You know, there were, there were enormous difficulties beque between some parties who wanted very strong federalism, other parties that wanted something called consoci consociationalism, and some who wanted a stronger center. And what we have is actually an attempt at combining, but in the allocation of powers and functions between, and even that, I mean, I, I said some call it spheres, the Constitution calls it spheres, but it may be better to talk about tiers so that the executive authority in dealing with issues, if a local authority is not performing, the president doesn't stand back and say, but it's the responsibility of that local authority because frequently they don't have the capabilities. And so if there were a sense of greater unity of purpose, you can actually achieve a lot more. Yeah. My reading of the Constitution is, I mean, it talks, about, it talks about independent but interrelated. And, and if you read chapter three that deals with cooperative governance, if you take those issues, you take a view on those issues, you're probably going to find you come closer to it. But you need to be active. You can't just sit back and allow things to fall apart. So that's the first observation. The second, and uh, uh, my problem is I can't read my handwriting. Uh, <laughs> I think the, the, the second issue, which is, which is how you remedy as you progress. Um, and, and I'd like to, to raise again something that I said earlier, which is, I suppose, a question. Who owns the MPs? Mm -hmm. and, and the question of the oath of office of MPs, and there are myriad examples. I mean, just, just pause for a moment and think about Nkandla and think about how parties voted. And I don't want to touch on some other issues. Uh, um, uh, but those are difficult issues. If something is wrong, don't pretend that it's not wrong. And, and then how you address these matters becomes fundamentally important. Former President Mbeki once asked in, a, in an ANC gathering, he said, what should the African National Congress do if the president has a case to answer? Don't defend him first. If you want the rule of law, then it has certain downsides, and engage with the rule of law. That becomes an important issue. And so the, these matters, I think, uh, uh, it, it's there. The, 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 there were brave MPs in trying to deal with state capture, but they kept being snuffed out. Think about those early ESCOM overviews. And then later, the speaker said, no, parliament can't look at what's happening at ESCOM. It has to be wrong in any language. It has to be anti-constitutional. And if you allow those, those behaviors to vest, then it's unbelievably difficult to recover from. And I think that those are, those are some of the issues that, that we need to, to deal with. The, 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 the other point about the, the, and it's the last point I'll make, I, I see Mr. van der Riel is very excited about time, but it's okay. <laughs> the last point I want to make um, relates to the responsibility for revenue collection. Yeah, we, 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 th there was an earlier period in history where, where what became Sasa was actually the grants were distributed by provinces and so, if they were spending more on grants and they had less to do other things, and became a very difficult issue, and there was an MEC in a particular province who said, uh, no, revenue is not my problem, it's, it's the MEC for finance's problem. <laughs> and 
president called her in and said, we want you to explain this to us because we have collective responsibilities. That's in the nature of the Constitution. If you don't address these issues, they become problems. Now, you can look at Tobo Tobo and say, but there's no revenue. But you can't take the same view when you come to Johannesburg. Johannesburg has had to cut its budget forecasts for 2024, 25, because it doesn't have the revenue. So never mind the fact that it can't repair what's broken, like a street that had blown up and so on and so on. It doesn't have the revenue. And revenue collection is a fundamental, important mandate that voters give governments in each of the spheres. If we don't deal with these kinds of issues, you can't remedy it. Thanks. Thanks. Mayor, over to you. I think let me just pick up on the question of revenue, because it's, it's obviously you could hear from my talk something that uh, I'm, I'm quite focused on and, and passionate about. And I really have a lot of sympathy for those who are trying to turn around cities, like my colleague uh, Celia Brunk in, in Tswane, who's doing an amazing job, but trying to turn around a city without, with, a, with a shrinking revenue base uh, is an unbelievably tough thing to do, unbelievably. You, it goes back to the question earlier. But once you get to a point where uh, services and infrastructure are uh, not just creaking and groaning, but actually collapsing, and so you're, you're paying customers, and remember in South Africa, a very small pool of paying customers uh, are, are actually leaving the, the revenue base, uh, and, and then you have to try and repair that infrastructure, which is extremely expensive, and then to the national budget, you have a decision again to cut infrastructure spending in uh, in in the midst of a you know of, of a very very shallow and disappointing growth environment. Interestingly, actually, I look at the the uh, uh, infrastructure numbers in in some detail. The, the South Africa has never spent more than it spent in 2009, the year before the Soccer World Cup on infrastructure. We can have a debate about whether that was productive infrastructure or not, but, but there was a lot of spending. And uh, actually, our current spending is lower than in 2000. We are spending less on infrastructure today than we spent in 2000, and the population has increased by several million by, uh, in that time. So that makes it incredibly tough to know how to improve the living conditions of the poor when you just have very, very little financial wiggle room uh, and, and space to do so. And more and more people are coming. And to your point, advocate, I don't think there's any way that there, there's, there's nothing that can be done to curb in migration to uh, urbanization. Uh, every country in the world, every city in the world, uh, you know, populations are kind of irrevocably urbanizing. And as I said, in the census, the South Africa, for the first time, half the country, just over half the country, lives in, in its biggest eight cities. And that, that is going to continue. Now, we recently, we figured out that we had a source of data that we were never using, because when you, when you buy a property in a municipality for the first time, uh, that municipality issues you with a new account number, like a, like a new bank account number. And so we have this information, but we never used it. And so we could actually figure out exactly how many people are buying a house in your city for the first time. And there's only two reasons why they would do that. Either they're uh, growing out of the house and buying their first home, or they're moving from, from somewhere, somewhere else. And uh, you know, so what I figured out was that we could actually track those numbers. And sometimes, I think last year, July, was 3,500 new homes, and I see some uh, of Cape Town's most successful estate agents in the in the room. That's you can they they are the beneficiary of this trend. Uh, the three and a half thousand first time Cape Townian homeowners in one month last last year July, uh, and and numbers similar to that uh, since. Then on on a more responsive government, uh, that's a, that's a critical issue. That's such a basic thing, but it really does influence the way that people view. Your, your, your government. I will remember my, one of my very first jobs in politics was working for the, uh, the then mayor of Cape Town, who's actually here, 
uh, Helen Ziller, and who set up that first successful governing coalition and, and who taught us a great deal about, uh, about how to govern properly. But one of the things that, that Helen used to do in, in, when she had a, a spare moment was to randomly call city telephone numbers from her desk and see if anyone answered. And you can imagine if someone took 20 rings to answer and then when you do eventually answer, it's the mayor on the other end of the line. <laughs> uh, but even worse if you don't answer at all. And that's a, that's a, a practice that I continue to, to do this day, just randomly spend a couple of minutes calling uh, people uh, in, our, in our internal directory and seeing if they actually are uh, practically responsive because if they're not answering uh, their phones and their emails, they certainly aren't answering members of the public. But I'm afraid to tell you my experience of the national state, uh, you, you send letters, sometimes on urgent matters, it's, it's as if there's just absolutely no one home. And I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's exactly the same. I, I hope they respect your office more than they do mine. But, uh, but I promise you there is just zero response. Zero response. Uh, we, you know, we, we've been trying to get some action out of the Department of uh, Public Works and Department of, Defense on the situa De Department of Defense on the situation around the castle. For two years we've been trying to, been in correspondence, not a single... Uh, barely a single response. And so sometimes I often say, why do you keep, journalists sometimes say, why do you keep running off to court? Why do you keep threatening legal action? But when, once you've sent 10 or 20 unanswered letters and tried to set up meetings which are not attended and so on, really you, you have no other uh, avenue of, of, of getting the, the outcome. Uh, then I think you, you asked a question about you know, how to heal the divides in our country. I think prosperity. Prosperity is the most important way. When people are feeling like they are making progress in life, that they have more opportunities, they tend to come to the center, they tend to uh, be good to one another, they tend to share and help one another, they tend to build community and not break it, and those are all of the social benefits that prosperity brings, never mind all of its very practical quality of life benefits. But the prosperous societies uh, tend to unite and, and, and heal divisions. The one exception, and it goes to your point about uh, the electoral system, it, it is remarkable how bitterly and vitriolically divided uh, the United States is. And, and they, you know, they're a very prosperous country, the most prosperous. Uh, and I think something about their electoral system helps to, you know, you, if, you, if you have to win the support of uh, radical fringes inside your own party in order to win a primary, uh, then you're constantly all of the political messaging is pushed towards that fringe all the time. So I'm actually quite a big believer in our electoral system. I think it's, it's going to work out for us in the long run. I, I, I wanted to pick up on something that the public protector raised, which, which relates to... It was your intro music. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> What's the time? Disco time. Uh, <laughs> The, the issue of succession in politics is actually an unbelievably complex issue. And uh, like the mayor looks to the US, l let me look outside of South Africa, just, just look at the government and the governing party in the UK. Rishi Sunak, Liz Truss, was that a name? Yeah. Dave Cameron, uh, you can run up and look at the short stints and the inability of parties to actually deal. It's, it's unbelievably complex. Unless you have hierarchical systems which are antithetical to democracy, to actually select people, it becomes an unbelievably difficult issue. And I think that's, that's what we lived through, and that certainly was the inflection point in 2007 in this country. Um, and, and the other side of it is that power is an interesting thing because people don't like to give it up. 
which is also important about the discussion on this day, um, the 2nd of February, 1990. But, but you know, I'm saying we need, we need, I, I want to go back to what the mayor said about, about Tswane. Now, now, part of the challenge is the geography of Tswane was extended to include vast areas. Geographically, it's unbelievably large. Kharankua, Hamanskral, uh, uh, right down uh, against the, the, the border with Johannesburg from an area which geographically has ratepayers, which is actually not much beyond the boundaries of Pretoria. So there's a mismatch. That's the one mismatch. The other mismatch is, is the public service. And when you negotiate in the public service, and in local government, it's pretty localized, so be careful what you wish for, sir. It's pretty localized, and when, when, you, when you negotiate like that, there's continuity. And I, I, the way in which I read the budget of Tswane is that they can't afford the public service that they have, and therefore they can't deliver the services, and they will be insolvent for a very long time into the future. These are the kinds of issues that we must bring in, and I think 30 years is a good time to bring these kinds of issues in and find a solution to it. But ditto, the cost of our public service at national and provincial level. It doesn't matter which department you want. I mean, you know, okay, so I picked on police. Let me continue, you know. If you look at the numbers in uh, the police service and you look at the return on that spending, there's zero return. We have a problem. How do we call it out? How do you deal with it? How do you insist that there be forensic capability? How do you instill measures to ensure that where there's been a crime perpetrated, that the criminal is brought to book, that convictions follow? How do you ensure that they are responsible for consequences in society so that it's not just an employment agency of people wearing blue uniforms? These become important challenges to, to resolve. Yeah. And I think that, that, that you've got to take the same view in other areas. I saw a chap with a Jake Scherville uh, blazer, so let me pick on education uh, for, <laughs> because, you, because of your blazer for no other reason. <laughs> Um, you know, there are teachers who work unbelievably hard. But our education system isn't delivering. You can look at the, 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 the outputs of Recep at Stellenbosch. Nick Spall's work has been quite remarkable. If at the age of 10, children can't read for meaning, they're not going to do mathematics. They're not going to do calculus at 18 and they're not going to become productive members of society. It's resolving those kinds of issues in very practical ways that will make a difference. Uh, and then we must insist that there be greater oversight of what happens uh, 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 in education to ensure that we monitor and measure as we progress through life. Uh, the idea that, that the only thing we must do is herd as many young people as possible into universities where the throughput rates are abysmal because people aren't properly prepared for universities is not a solution. We, sh we could do much, much better by a greater investment in vocational training and Absolutely. skills, and we will re-industrialize this country. Absolutely. <clears throat> let, me, let me grab the opportunity to, to pose uh, also a question from my side to the three speakers in front. I. Yeah, maybe it's, it's a very sort of biased opinion, but it seems to me that our people fail to take ownership of democracy. And let me explain by a few examples. If you look at the School Governing Act, I used to be a teacher, and Premier Helen Ziller, we worked together you know, a few decades ago. The problem is that when we started off, the School Governing Act gave parents the power to take charge of the school. And many an evening, you would call on elections, ask the parents to come and be part of the school governing body, but nobody pitch up. And those who pitch up tries to capture it for their own interest. And then the fighting starts. 
Who suffers at the end? School kids, the school becomes dysfunctional. And I spent a, some time in agriculture. We worked very hard to bring about uh, sustainable land reform. So we worked with uh, communal property associations, and there the same thing happened. Ownership of the land was given back to the people. They had to elect a committee. Yo, only a few months down the line, suddenly the money starts to disappear. The group of people captures the entire process for their own benefit in fighting. The end result, a complete collapse of that once very productive farm. You look at municipalities, people are invited to be part of uh, compiling a, you know, a IDP, uh, but few are interested. Uh, so uh, at the end of the day, uh, people who are at the uh, helm of a, a municipality just uh, f uh, decide to do what they do best, and that is to take care of their own interests. So what is government's response? Government respond by trying now, okay, you're not appreciative of the power that we've given you, now we're going to centralize power. So now you've got the Bella Act, and you've got other acts that try to take power back from those communities, and we know that will be equally disastrous. And we often put our hope in the people. We say the people of South Africa will save this democracy, will save our country from complete collapse. But if the people don't take ownership of democracy, what is there left? And perhaps you have all the wisdom, advocate, help us to solve that problem. <laughs> you know, I'd like to start with your latter comment. Um, and I'm going to make an example with the voting cues. <laughs> you know, uh, you would see the disparities in the voting cues. And and if you if you live in the suburban areas or you vote in the suburban areas, and with the transformation in our country, there's a high rate of uh, you know African people who live there, but they are less in that queue, and you would find that um, the white race is the majority, even a very ill health person or an elderly would go out and vote. Now, and this is my analysis, what is the literacy rate in our country? And where is that literacy rate? What is the awareness rate in our country? When we crossed over to democracy, how much has been done to educate, empower, and make people aware of that right? My analysis is that the apartheid system invested a lot in building consciousness. And how much of that has been built by the democratic system? I think the people still lack that. Yes, there are some who don't want to take ownership, but for me, the vast majority is that we need to move with the people into the democratic dispensation and probably is one of the reviews that need to be done 30 years later on what should be done in order to ensure that you've got a society that's conscious, you build patriotism. People were excluded from the functionality of the country. Now, is it that easy to just say, let's move on, we are here now, come along? What then needs to be done? And for me, it's part of that healing process that needs to take place as a country. And, and the transformation process and to transform the mind. It's like a child who's never been taught that reading must become a part of their DNA from little. And uh, you expect that one day you'd say you need to be a reading nation when that was never inculcated into that person. 
Um, yeah, the issue of, the high, of our higher education system is something else. Uh, yes, we are a developing country, but I think we are faring far behind. The skills that we are prioritizing now is the skills that the rest of the world is saying. We've got the fourth industrial revolution, and therefore there are other emerging skills. And correctly, what Mr. Manuel is saying is that we need vocational training in South Africa, but wasn't that the intention of the FET colleges? What's the output of the FET colleges? Are we even measuring it? Can we even measure it, you know? Uh, I'm, I really struggle with that perspective. The CETAs, the, the CETAs have the highest surplus almost every year. What then is the vision or the foresight in that respect? I think those are part of the issues that we are still grappling on. I don't want to leave out the issue of the public service wage. Um, I wouldn't isolate the public service wage from the rest of the fiscal leaks in our country. And I think what makes the issue of the public service wage worse is that you are paying somebody who is basically pushing a paper for somebody else to be paid, you know? We also have a high consultancy rate in our country. Work that public servants should be doing themselves are actually outsourcing. Mostly in a public service, just to put together an event like this, you need to, to get an events company, but there are people who are actually employed to do that work. So my view is that it really needs to be looked at in its totality. I mean, you look at our, um, the state attorney. Why do you have state attorneys who, who outsource attorneys? They are attorneys themselves. Why do we have this, that kind of a state attorney? So I think it, it really needs to be looked at holistically and we need to find that solution. As the public wage grows, the consultancy rate grows, what are these people doing here? It means they, they don't have the skill. We basically have administrators, but in the form of professionals who outsource the work that they are supposed to be doing. So it's really something that, um, that needs to be, to be strengthened. I do not agree that we can totally not curb urbanization. I, I, I don't agree. I think something can be done to at least lower it. I mean, the, the issues of agriculture. Some of the people who, who are in the cities don't want to be there. They are forced to be there because of the circumstances. There are no opportunities in the rural areas. Uh, in my hometown in Umzimkulu, people have built massive houses. Public servants in Pretoria. You know, they live there. They live there. I know many of my peers. Many of my peers actually live there. You know, they, they are striving in farming, uh, obviously work in the municipality, et cetera. But if there were opportunities, if we would create new cities, but also leverage on our agriculture, you know, as a country, we've got the land. Do, are we, we are merely saying we would transfer the land, but to whom are you transferring this land? What is the skill that this person is being given? What is the support? So I think unless we are able to answer or deal with those kind of systemic and historical issues, we'd be able to redress. But by merely giving somebody the land, merely giving them the tractor, giving them the money, it is actually not going to work the land. It is the skill that is required. Thank you. Let me get to my two colleagues. Can you perhaps step forward, Daniela and Ishmael? Um, they have been appointed recently at the foundation. They are also uh, legally um, or uh, yeah, legal backgrounds. Um, and I must tell you, I need to really 
know my <clears throat> steps there in the office because they watch every movement and they can easily just give me a lawyer's letter. <laughs> so to keep them calm, any questions that you would like to pose? Perhaps let me grab the mic over there and then... All right, so the first question that our audience would like to know is addressed to Mr. Trevor Manuel. So the NDP was a roadmap for progress and prosperity, and you mentioned the ossification of institutions. And we're not seeing the NDP being implemented, apart from what Mr. Hill Lewis is saying, bits of it in Cape Town. As citizens, not the state, not the government, as citizens, what can we do to start reversing the ossification in state institutions and what can we do to prevent further ossification? Can we book everybody into the hotel for the next week? <laughs> we need a lot of time on this one. I mean, Ossification happens across the board. I, I, I think that, that some of the reflections on the public service would be one part of it. If nobody, I mean, when we got into government in 1994, there was something that, that we thought existed in Bantustans only. You have a spare jacket that you hang over the chair. You never go to work, the jacket is always hanging there. Uh, and so when people say, where is Koleka? Because the jacket is here. No, 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 she's just gone to the ladies down. She never returns. I mean, that was a big problem. It still is a problem. And so the phones are unanswered, and so technology hasn't even closed that gap. That is a big, big issue. But so much of what you're talking about is management. You see, all government departments need to be managed. Where people are, what time they pitch up, how they dress, what their professionalism or lack thereof is, is all a function of management. And without management, you're not going to resolve the problem. Um, and, and, and that management needs to be focused on new style of work, inclusiveness, and so on and so on. And, and, and if you have management that is alive, then you resist the ossification of institutions. I mean, you can, you can look at any of the state-owned enterprises or government departments. Uh, I, I had to encounter uh, last week, uh, Maria and I went to Home Affairs and I, I sent a message to some people saying, if I'm not out, if you don't find me by Tuesday, please come to Barrack Street. I'm still <laughs> going to be there. Uh, but the absence of rules is unbelievable. Huh? I mean, eventually I had to get a passport of a child and I had to call the minister and say, your DDG says he doesn't, he can't approve, yes, all the documents for me to go and collect it. And the minister then called him and said, you can. When you can't run a basic function like that, you're not going to resolve the issues. The same applies. I mean, you know, uh, there was a story this week about uh, uh, the Department of Health in Gauteng. And, you know, if, if, if for food purchases, PP, if they only try to compare what the, a basket of food costs, and they do this for the big supermarkets, and government has economies of scale and should do better than the cheapest supermarket. The fact that they're paying thrice what you'd pay in a supermarket is insane. And you use up the budget like that, and then you can't deal with the most elementary health service related matters. It's those kinds of issues. Now, I made a point earlier saying, the minister's responsibility is not to arrive on the crime scene. The minister's responsibility is to ensure that the department is well resourced and that, that their functions are planned and that they execute according to plan and that he will be accountable 
for the outcomes in Parliament. And so Parliament must ask him or her. But that doesn't happen. And so everybody wanders around. They fly around from pillar to post, and the work does not get done. And so you don't have a metric that says what crime was committed, who was arrested, what happened to them, when did they appear in court, you know, the, and, and some of these issues, immediately after we adopted the Constitution in 96, uh, uh, I, saw, I saw Sheila Camera somewhere. She, she might remember some of these things. One of the th 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 there, there was spare capacity from the Constitutional Assembly, and one of the things that we tried to do then was to, it wasn't even called digitalization, but to get an electronic record of dockets. Right? So the police would employ people who can type, not somebody who's battling to write a statement uh, in two hours, a one-page statement. No, somebody can type uh, a touch type, and, and then this, 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 your, your statement goes into the record. It's delivered to the office of the prosecutors. You get a copy. The police has a copy. And then the case can proceed. Money was spent on computers. It has still not been done. Right? So we'll celebrate this year uh, the 28th anniversary of our Constitution in May. Uh, when that decision was taken, it has still not been done. Hmm. You've got to arrest the rot. That's what you've got to do. And that's what management is about, actually. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Ishmael, over to you. Well, speakers, I'm sure I speak on behalf of the entire audience when I say that we were all very captivated by every syllable that you spoke and how great it is for us to all now actively engage with you. So I have in front of me a question that I may as well have drafted myself. Uh, I have no memories of 1990, nor any memories of 1994, because I make up what they call the born free generation. And people like me, you, make up the largest portion of our population. And so this question directed to the public protector. Ma'am, how do you envisage achieving a more active citizenship among the youth of South Africa? Thank you. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I, I really struggled to even get my son to register to vote. <laughs> uh, I literally had to force him to vote and remind him that... Is that constitution? Uh, <laughs> in my house. <laughs> you know, um, we need to move with the times. We need to be relevant. We need to be real time as a nation. And, and I think that's what we are grappling with. I'm going to make the example of registering to vote. Yes, you register online to vote. It's, it's easy. But when you go and vote, young people must then go and stand in, that, in those long lines. Do they have the appetite for that? Born freeze are technological people. So if we are really a country that has foresight, we should have envisaged that at this era of our democracy, the 2000s would be voting. And what kind of creatures are they? How do we make them interested in, into this dispensation? Now, we still have the systems we had in 1994, and we expect them to be active participants and involved participants in this dispensation. Which, in which they are living in. But also, they are world citizens, not just South Africans. They've got peers in other parts of the globe. Now, the disparities between a young person in South Africa and a young person in New York, now, how do we make them active participants and involved citizens in South Africa when most of them are actually saying, I'm leaving the country. Those who can afford to don't even want to study in the country. Oh. But also, we are breeding a youth that 
is not a 1976 youth. Now, have we transformed as a country from the 1976 youth that's not necessarily physically militant, but also not mentally militant, but that is more intelligence driven in line with the issues that are happening in society and in the globe today. Yeah. Mine is that really, as a country, and it's not necessarily government's job to do that, I think it's our work, each and every one of us, is that we need to transform. Again, it comes to the issue of transformative leadership, whether it's from the home, it's from society, the community, and, um, and the country at large. But I think, uh, the past or the indigenous ways in which we used to do things are also not totally outdated. They grow up without that indigenous knowledge. So most of the things they get, they get it as they move along. The parents are not there, we are working, we travel, we do this and that. Now, most of them have to learn this uh, from their own peers, and, and mostly through technology. The cyberspace is filled with young people. Now, what kind of information is being put into that cyberspace where they are? Are we putting our indigenous ways or culture to ensure that they at least understand and know where we come from. You just said, you are not there, you. So are we putting those enough? Are we utilizing TikTok enough? You know, are we utilizing Instagram enough to get an active citizenry out of them? We still go and deliver IDPs at a, at a town hall. Are you gonna find them in a town hall? So for me, really, it's through relevance. Okay, a last question to the mayor. Any one of you? So from the audience, an address to you, Mr. Mayor, is you mentioned that there is more jobs having been created in the city of Cape Town than in any other metro in South Africa. If you can pin down one specific ingredient that has contributed to that success, what would that be? Perhaps the ease of doing business in Cape Town and also how does that alleviate one of the critical issues we have going into the elections, our high youth unemployment? And? Thank you, Ismail. Given that you said that we need a bold, ambitious statement, a vision as a country, and I would say probably tackling youth unemployment feeds into that, what in your own words would be something like that? Because that would unify us. That would serve against what, what Christo mentioned about self-interest taking over when people g are given power, because we're all rallying behind this vision for the future. It's hard to, hello? Right. It's hard to pinpoint one key ingredient. I think it, over time you create an environment in which economic growth is a self-fulfilling prophecy and uh, businesses are attracted to invest in your city or your country. Uh, entrepreneurs feel optimistic about the future, so they make investment decisions to grow their business, and, uh, and that becomes self-reinforcing and self-fulfilling. Certainly, uh, Cape Town has been blessed by a huge surge in uh, overseas tourism to our city uh, that has broken previous records, and that is a wonderful uh, economic growth uh, sector or industry because it is, uh, it's exactly what South Africa needs. It's labor absorptive. It's very labor intensive, the, the tourism and hospitality industry. And it has a huge and very complex supply chain. So it benefits lots and lots of different businesses in ways that you wouldn't even automatically assume. Uh, and so the fact that Cape Town has got 2.9 million overseas visitors last year, which is a, which is a record for us, and 317,000 in, in December alone, is, has been a huge boon to our local economy. And many of those are American uh, tourists. I'm sure you have heard American accents uh, in growing numbers on the streets of Cape Town. 
And a, a large part of that is because there has been a, a, a big increase in the number of direct flights from North America to, uh, to Cape Town, directly to Cape Town, not just to South Africa. And, and that has been one of the most important things that our, uh, our government worked on before my time was just securing those, uh, those direct flights to, uh, directly to Cape Town and they have paid off in many multiples. Uh, so I think that's probably the one thing I'd point to, but there's many others. When you have infrastructure that works, uh, businesses can feel confident about, about the future. When you treat the private sector like a partner, not like an enemy, uh, as, as the private sector is unfortunately often treated by our national government, with a statement by, uh, I think, the minister in the presidency, uh, that um, kind of, you know, business and the, and the banking sector in particular are, are traitorous and unpatriotic, all this kind of, that is not the kind of sentiment that attracts investment. Far from it, it repels, repels investment and, and repels growth. Uh, so, uh, you know, I hope that, that businesses know that they are genuinely valued because they are actually the only job creators, by the way. Government does not create jobs. It does not. They are, I don't know. Uh, there are, there are something like a million people that work for the states in South Africa <coughs> at various levels, if I remember correctly, 1.4 million people. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that there are 17 million people employed in South Africa. And, uh, and, and so the vast, vast majority of people are employed by, uh, by entrepreneurs who take a risk, invest, start a business, have a good idea, build a business, that business becomes a medium-sized business and eventually, if they're successful, becomes a large business. And so an economy grows and prosperity is delivered. <coughs> that is how we view the private sector in Cape Town uh, and, and are only too grateful and see part of our role as doing everything possible to make life easier for them rather than treat them with, with suspicion. So I think those are probably... Oh, then you asked me about national ambition. I think it's closely tied to that. If I had to summarize it in a sentence, I would say to focus our entire nation on growing the economy more rapidly so that we can get people out of poverty and into work. That should be our national ambition. Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> we have now, we have now come to the end of our panel discussion. We will have a very brief uh, uh, session now where we will hand over an award and a few other um, th things to be done. Uh, we will then, at six o'clock, we will then move to the Atlantic restaurant to go and enjoy a glass of wine and some other uh, delicious things. I think the important thing for me now is just to acknowledge the presence of our board members here. And I just want them perhaps uh, so that you can see who they are, starting with obviously our newly elected chairperson, Elita. If you perhaps just <clears throat> can rise. We also have Lulu, if you can just rise. Okay. Uh, Christina, if you can just rise. Uh, let me see where's Kutsia Bester over there. Thank you. We have also Jeanette. Where's Jeanette over there? We also have our chairman Emeritus, Dave. <clears throat> and then there's a few others that will not that are not present here today. But the important thing is our building will be opened in March, and I really want to commend Dave Stewart for his tremendous role that he's played to um, bring about and to realize uh, that project. And uh, within that building, we'll have a series of dialogues and a whole range of activities aimed at um, our, our vision and mission and make sure that we contribute towards uh, taking our country forward. So on this note, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask our panelists just to take up their seats. And then I want to 
our chairperson to come forward. So Elita will then do a, the handover of the FW De Klerk Goodwill Award to the Kailam project. If uh, Dave, David, if you can perhaps step forward. It's been riveting, I must say, for me at least, the past session. Um, we've come to the time now that we are going to award the Goodwill Award. The FW de Klerk Goodwill Award was established by the Foundation Board in October 2010 to honor the person or organization who, in its opinion, has made an exemplary contribution to the promotion of goodwill between South Africans. The FW de Klerk Foundation takes great pleasure in announcing that Kaya Lam, meaning my home, will be the recipient of its 2023 Goodwill Award. Now, um, if I may, David, initially this was sort of the concept of a gentleman called Leon Lowe in the 70s, and uh, he felt a little bit left out, but that's why I'm mentioning him. Now, David Ansara is, has brought together the Free Market Foundation in 2013. It's to help to honor the basic right by providing shelter, security to people. It makes the ideal property ownership a practical reality by helping qualifying disadvantaged South Africans who live in homes formerly owned by government to obtain title deeds to their property, properties. We choose Kayalam as the recipient of this year's Goodwill Award because property ownership <laughs> transforms the lives of ordinary people everywhere. It gives them dignity, it empowers them, it provides security, and opens up new economic opportunities for them. We at the <coughs> FW De Klerk Foundation, we would like to acknowledge your aspiration, effort, and perseverance by awarding you this Goodwill Award. You can you can have a seat, yes? David, over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Elita and the FW Clark Foundation. We prepared a short video, which will, I think, in very many communities in South Africa, succinctly describe owning the project. a piece of land is more than just a means of livelihood. It's a symbol of security, a foundation for a better future. Sadly, for many poor South Africans, the dream of property ownership remains just that, a dream. How can we make this dream a reality? The answer is simple, but not easy. My name is David Ansara, Chief Executive of the Free Market Foundation, a think tank a non-profit organization dedicated to the promotion of individual freedom and economic prosperity for all South Africans. We at the Free Market Foundation believe that everyone deserves a chance to build a better life for themselves and their families. That's why we're on a mission to provide free title deeds to those in need. <laughs> In 
this community have had homes but they've never owned it and we're here today with the Kai Alam initiative to, to give them that title deed, that piece of paper that means so much. In 1913, the Natives Land Act effectively robbed black South Africans of their property rights. These fundamental human rights were further eroded during the apartheid period. Despite the advent of democracy, many South Africans still live as tenants of the state, eking out an existence on the margins of South Africa's economy. That is why in 2010, the Free Market Foundation launched what was perhaps the most important voluntary initiative to support private property rights in South Africa, the Kailam Project. The Kai Lum project aimed to turn these council tenants into homeowners for the very first time. Daniel Matumbe, 92 years old, and today was the first time that he could say, now I own my home. It changes my life a lot because I was a tenant, so now I'm happy in place that I would call it my home for my kids and me, so that I'm very happy that I have a land. By working together with local municipalities and a team of conveyances, we helped to convert dead capital into dynamic capital. It took us three years to transfer our first title deeds. In October 2013, exactly 100 years after the signing of the Natives Land Act, the Kai Lam Project symbolically handed out 100 title deeds to beneficiaries at its inaugural ceremony. Since then, we have been busy extending property rights to council tenants across the country. In fact, the Kai Lam project recently celebrated a major milestone. I'm proud to announce that we recently completed 10,000 title deed transfers. Over 3,000 of these transfers took place last year in 2022. We could not have achieved this milestone without the ongoing support of our partner organizations, including our generous corporate and individual sponsors, municipalities, and the conveyances who make these transfers possible. Private property rights are the basic building blocks for a free and prosperous society. Research shows that countries with strong private property rights tend to get wealthier over time. Property rights allow poor people to invest and upgrade their homes, to secure collateral for a loan to finance a business venture, or to settle disputes over their property. The economic benefits of private property rights are undeniable. But perhaps more important is the recognition of the fundamental dignity of property owners. <laughs> We do not see the poor as a special category. Poor people are ordinary people with the same hopes and aspirations as you and I. Let's give them the dignity and the agency that they deserve. If you care about turning council tenants into property owners, please support our work at Kai Lam. For a mere 2,950 Rand, you can help to secure ownership for a home that is worth approximately 100,000 Rand. You can't get greater bang for your buck. All donations are tax deductible. We also encourage more municipalities, corporates and individuals to partner with us. With your help, we can bring true, lasting home ownership to all South Africans. Well, I wanted to extend a very sincere thank you uh, on behalf of the Free Market Foundation and the Kai Lam Project and the many dozens of people and institutions that have been involved in this project. I want to extend that thank you to the FW de Klerk Foundation. Elisa, thank you very much. Christo, uh, we wish you all the best in your new role. There's a, a big challenge, but I am convinced that you're the right man for the job. And uh, to Dave Stewart as well. 
uh, I think you leave a proud institutional legacy at the F.W. de Klerk Foundation. And speaking of, of legacy, uh, I think it's very fitting as we sit here on the anniversary of F.W. de Klerk's uh, significant announcement that we also reflect on his uh, role that he played in the Kai Alum project, albeit indirectly. Uh, and uh, as Vladimir Lenin once wrote, there are decades where nothing happens, and then there are weeks when decades happen. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not often quoting communists, but I think it's a very, uh, very appropriate uh, quote. And that first week of February 1990 uh, certainly uh, triggered uh, a significant uh, series of events that I think we're still living with today. And perhaps, as we've suggested, uh, we are on the cusp of more great significant changes in South Africa. But I referred to uh, President de Klerk's legacy, and one of those legacies was the passing of the Upgrading of Land Tenure Act in 1991, which essentially divested the state of its ownership of uh, many of these council-owned properties. So our job uh, as the Kai Lum Project, uh, several decades later, we saw an opportunity there to, to finish the job, uh, to formalize the ownership status of many of the, the people who once resided as tenants of the state and now to, to, to fully realize their private property rights and their ownership over the, the homes in which they'd lived sometimes for generations. So as I mentioned in the video, uh, the economic benefits of private property are, are numerous. And uh, uh, I think it was very uh, important and significant uh, that last year in July, the F.W. de Klerk Foundation hosted a private property rights for all South Africans conference, which was attended by uh, several of the delegates here today, uh, which really underscored the importance of a private property as a building block for economic prosperity. And a, a, a notable speaker there was uh, Hernando de Soto, the uh, Peruvian Nobel Prize winning economist, uh, who said, uh, not at the conference, but in his book, The Mystery of Capital, quote, without an integrated formal property system, a modern market economy is inconceivable, end quote. Um, but also very telling at that same conference uh, was a representation, a, a, a video talk by Fernando Spirito uh, from Venezuela, who spoke about the tragedy of the situation in that country in which private property rights were systematically abrogated and eroded, um, and what he called uh, an illiberal democracy. So private property rights are inseparable from civil and political rights. And they're not something that we can bestow on anyone. They are inalienable. They are fundamental to your right as a human being. And so it's not ne necessarily merely a policy choice. It's a recognition of your fundamental dignity as an individual. Um, so I am receiving this award uh, but I myself individually played a very small role in the Kai Alum project. I've uh, been CEO of the Free Market Foundation since uh, January of 2023. Um, and I really do stand on the shoulders of giants. And one of those giants uh, was the late Perry Feldman, uh, who was uh, not a policy analyst or uh, uh, a, 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 an expert in these matters, but he was a farmer. And he recognized the importance of extending uh, ownership to uh, ordinary South Africans who had been deprived of that ownership right. Uh, and, and he was one of the individuals, together with several others, who really uh, drove that project and its genesis in 2010 to 2013. And so I just want to acknowledge him posthumously for his, his incredible contribution uh, to that. Um, and then, uh, more presently, I'd like to extend thanks to uh, Terry Markman, who currently manages the project. Uh, he has incredible energy and commitment uh, to this initiative. Uh, Solon Lorna Sachs in uh, Paris, which is really the epicenter of the Kai Alum project. Um, Dot Corrigan as well, who provides administrative support. We also want to particularly extend thanks uh, to uh, the many sponsors who have, without their financial commitment, this uh, project would not have been possible. Uh, particularly Johan Rupert uh, and uh, his Raynet Foundation uh, and Remgro more broadly has been a fantastic partner in this initiative. Uh, First National Bank uh, deserves particular uh, thanks for uh, instigating 
us to uh, initiate the first pilot project uh, back in, uh, uh, in 2013, uh, where the first 100 uh, title deeds were, were handed out. Uh, but other financial institutions such as Capitec, ABSA, Standard Bank, and IPIC have all played uh, a role. And then, of course, uh, the municipalities. Uh, too many to mention here, but uh, in Gwati, uh, Stellenbosch municipality has been a big supporter, as well as the, the city of Cape Town. So thank you, uh, Mayor, to you and your colleagues for, for supporting the initiative here. Um, but uh, the conveyances and, and other many people who, who make this project uh, possible, uh, I think, uh, deserve a special mention as well. So I just wanted to uh, extend a very special thanks to everybody at the FW de Klerk Foundation. I think you are carrying forward uh, the late president's legacy very ably and contributing very much to the promotion of the rule of law and constitutional democracy in this country. I think it's very important that civil society organizations such as yourselves, uh, such as the Free Market Foundation, use their voice uh, to promote uh, change and freedom in South Africa. Uh, there's still a lot of unfinished business. Um, it is definitely an exciting place to be. So thank you very much. Thank you. We will have uh, Christina to uh, please assist with the following handovers. Um, the, the Clerk Foundation also hand over um, financial assistance to deserving charities. Uh, Christina, over to you. It's my absolute pleasure and privilege to announce the beneficiaries of the 2023 NetBank South African Golf Day. And uh, I would like to call up the Cape Town Society for the Blind, Iris House Children's Hospice, Life Choices, and National Institute for the Deaf. So if representative for, for the four charities would please come up. And while they're coming up, I would just like to share a quote by uh, Maya Angelou with you, which I find very fitting. If it is true that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, isn't it also true a society is only as healthy as its sickest citizen and only as wealthy as its most deprived? I think this is a valid question we all must ask ourselves, and we also have to ask ourselves what are we doing to make the weakest, strong, weakest link stronger? And I think I... I applaud you for, for strengthening the chain and making us as a society healthier and wealthier. Thank you very much. Uh, can I ask the recipients just to come to the front, uh, to my right, so that you can receive and then just line up for a nice photo over there. Peter, can you also just stand here at the back for the photo, no? Yeah, no, no, yeah. You cannot leave without your check. Whilst uh, the checks are being handed out, I'm going to ask Elita then to conclude our program for the day. And as I've said, after this, you're all more than welcome to come and enjoy um, uh, uh, some uh, very nice uh, drinks and some other edibles uh, in the restaurant. Elita? 
Ladies and gentlemen, before I come to my closing remarks, I would like to thank our wonderful speakers today. Um, you, were, you gave us a lot of food for thought. There are also two gentlemen here, Eddie Mayer and Wayne Bronghorst, who are the current owners of Wildebarde Yacht. They donated generously wine to us, which we will drink tonight, <laughs> but also uh, a big amount for us to have for our cellar. Now, um, Wildebarde Yacht belonged to FW and myself for 10 years. We had 10 wonderful years there. So we are very happy that you are looking after a special place. Um, because it's FW's speech anniversary of the 2nd of February 1990, I would like to say something that he said at the conference at the conference in 2015. If I had been woken early on the morning of the 2nd of February 90 and would have seen what South Africa would look like 25 years later, with all its threats and shortcomings, I should still embrace that future with both hands and without any reservation. I would still have made the speech that I made on that day, not because I had to, but because my colleagues and I were convinced that it was the right thing to do, convinced that the road to a peaceful future was to bring justice for all. What we have now is so much better than what we had in the past. All of us, all South Africans of goodwill, should redouble our efforts to work for the realization of the values articulated in our Constitution. For a country based on human dignity, the achievement of equality, and the advancement of human rights and freedoms. All of us should work to ensure that those who are committed to loving will prevail over those on all sides who are retrogressing into the old patterns of hating. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful occasion. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our proceedings. It's Friday night and there's 5,000 bottles of wine waiting for us. <laughs> <laughs>